Thanks everyone for being here. My name is Mark Modulesky, and uh, I cannot tell you how excited I am to see you all in person. So thanks, thanks for being here. We've got some stragglers out there at the exhibit hall. We'll just wave at them, I guess. Okay, um, thanks again for being here. This is the 190th um, New York State Ag Society Forum. That's a lot, that's a big number. We're coming up on 200 years and we're, we're excited to be here in person again. I've got a handful of little announcements before we get on with our program. Wanted to spend a few minutes in just telling you that the name of the, the, the theme of today is flexibility. As you know, it's been a challenging time um, organizing an event like this, especially with what's going on in the world. Um, between travel and snow and all that type of stuff, we've had to change some things around. So our, our keynote speaker is going to join us. He's going to join us from a hotel room in Denver, Colorado. He's from California, and that's if you don't know, that's halfway in between here and there. Um, so we're excited to see, still have him uh, be here. Um, our FFA chapter award winners, the Tug Hill got 18 to 20 inches of snow last night, so unfortunately those kids can't be here. Um, as I was told this morning, it's the first snow day they've had in two years, and it would have been the first event that they would have been able to attend in person in almost two years. So they're very disappointed, but we're going we're gonna to do our best to honor them. Um, some protocol pieces. There's this little thing called COVID going around. You guys have probably heard of it. And we're going to do our best um, to just keep each other safe. So our protocols uh, based on city and county and state rules are to stay masked um, unless you're actively eating or drinking and do our best to stay away from each other. If you've noticed, our tables are tables that are generally seating for eight and we have six tables there. So we're trying to do our best to keep people spread out. Um, there is some hand sanitizer and those types of things scattered around the facility, and uh, we encourage you to use that. For lunch, um, we are going to be in the same room, similar to previous uh, times. We're going to leave after the program. They're going to set up lunch. And we're going to come back and eat. And we would encourage you to stay with the folks that you came with rather than mingling too, too much. And again, that's just part of the, part of the protocol. I wanted to uh, thank the New York product sponsors. There's a banner outside that talks about all the New York State um, product that was donated, and we'll have that product throughout the day. So thanks for all those folks, and please um, notice their, their banner outside and uh, the food that we're about to eat. We're excited about doing that. A big shout out goes to Peter Pamkowski. Most of you who have been in, at the forum for any length of time know Peter. And Peter is instrumental in not only planning this, but, but planning and gathering uh, the food for the forum. He's unable to be with us today, but I just wanted to tell him thank you. Uh, recording. You, you may or may not be on camera, so I'm just giving you that heads up. We are recording the forum. Um, we're going to record the forum and uh, have three different pieces that will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, for folks who are unable to be here to, uh, to dial in and flip through and see the content of what will be a, a great program. So uh, just, just so that you know, there's a hand for you I'm a little worried about, so that's why I wanted to make sure I let you know you may be on camera. You know who you are, right? You guys are really lively this morning. I appreciate it. That's great. It's excellent. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, what's been going on in the Ag Society. I have a president's report and I have a whole bunch of stuff to go through. We'll try to get through it really quickly. Um, the board of directors of both the Ag Society and the Ag Society Foundation have met quite often over the last couple of years with the focus to continue the Ag Society's mission um, during what has been an uh, unprecedented time. Um, I'd like to thank a few people uh, and then I'd like to talk to you about some of the things that are going on and just put up here our forum sponsors. Um, this event is, is run by sponsorships. The folks that are exhibiting out there, as well as our, our primary sponsors, uh, donate money that help us put this on. Our forum sponsors are Cornell Cals, Farm Credit East, and the Department of Ag and Markets, and we're very thankful for them for their financial support. So let's give them a round of a hand, applause. Thank you very much. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some exciting news that our uh, board of directors had have approved, and it's in there. It's our um, our new mission statement. And can we get to the mission statement? You'll see some scrolling things on the board of our other sponsors. We have our forum sponsors, we have our gold, our platinum, and our exhibitors. And you'll see some of their booths and some of those sponsorships, not only in your booklet, but up on screen. And we appreciate if you would take a little bit of time to um, 
to look through those. Uh, as the Ag Society continues to grow, our challenge is to balance tradition, what we've always done, with how do we stay relevant going future? How do, how do we change? And in that vein, we decided to relook at our mission statement. And our mission statement was um, altered this summer. Our board of directors, along with uh, folks from the Ag Society Foundation board of directors, got together to rethink this mission statement that will help us go through the next 10 years. 10 years is a bit strategic, um, it's a bit random, but if we're at 190 years, we wanted to make sure we're on the right path and we have our focus for the next 10, which will lead us, which will lead us to our bicentennial, which is our 200 year anniversary. Um, I wanted to read that to you because this is what our focus is going to be. So we hope that you all will continue to support the Ag Society and its programming and, and help us get the word out to grow this event even more. So our, our mission statement, our new mission statement is to build a robust future for New York's food, agricultural, and natural resource industries by providing networking and educational opportunities for its strongest advocates, decision makers, and aspiring leaders. For those of you who can't recite our previous mission statement by heart, I know there's several of you in the room that probably can do that. Lauren, if, would you like to stand up and repeat it? Okay, thank you, appreciate that. <clears throat> um, it's very deliberate in our, in our approach. And the reason for that is we feel like what the Ag Society does in particular is aspire future leaders, provide opportunities for folks to be inspired and educated, and mostly to provide this, an opportunity for agriculture to come together and network. Within that, we have um, a little acronym that uh, some of you may know, a man by the name of Rick Zimmerman, very well known, great guy. I don't think Rick is here today, Ann, is he not? He's not here today. But he helped us come up with an acronym for us to understand what this new mission statement is doing. And that acronym, many of you will understand this word, it's, this word, it's called FARM. You guys know how to spell that word? F-A-R-M? Okay. So FARM stands for Forum, the Ambassador Scholars, Recognition, and messaging, and then the farms is stewardship. And those are the, the five areas that the Ag Society is gonna focus on. Our focus is to make sure that um, we can put on a great event, that we can introduce and promote young folks, who we'll talk a little bit about the ambassadors here in a minute, promote their growth and networking, stay positive in our messaging, and make sure we're promoting, um, promoting good stewardship. So we're excited to implement our new mission statement and a round of applause for those who worked on it. Thanks very much. Okay, in your program, there's a thing called the business meeting, which is what we're gonna to get to now. I am gonna be honest with you, for those of you who, who know me, you know that I'm very open. Uh, I attended the Ag Society Forum for several years before I even understood what the business meeting was. So I'm gonna spend a few seconds and tell you what that is so that for the folks who are new in the room, you don't have to sit through three or four of them to understand what's going on. So the Ag Society is a membership organization, right? All of us pay dues to be a member of this organization to get content and access to our forum, to our network, and to our summer meetings. That organization is run by a set of bylaws and inside those bylaws, um, there are some things that we need to do to operate as a business. Some of those things are have a financial report, accept minutes of what we've done, um, how we use our money, uh, how we govern our board, who are, who, who's elected, who our officials are. So there's certain things that we're gonna go through as a matter of process that's gonna help us get through that. So the first one on that is Katie Carpenter Bigness is our secretary, where's Katie? There she is, hey Katie, how you doing? Everybody, if you see Katie, please say hello and thank you. Um, Katie does a tremendous amount of work for us, and I don't know if anyone has ever taken notes at a board meeting before and then summarized those, but it's a lot of work, and we appreciate you, Katie, so thank you for doing that. Katie has distributed and has um, the 2021 annual meeting um, minutes. Can I have a motion to accept those minutes as written? Timmy, VZ, thank you. Do I have a second? There we go, Jeanette, thanks. Um, all in favor? Any opposed? Great, all carried, thank you. Now you understand why the business part of that has to happen, right? All right, fantastic. So the next part of my little speech here is uh, the president's report, and I'm gonna do my best to, uh, to get through that relatively quickly so you can get on to the fun parts of the, uh, 
of the program. Again, I want to thank the Department of Agriculture, uh, CALS at Cornell, Farm Credit, and the Ag Society Foundation. Without their financial support, we couldn't do this. So we really appreciate them being part of, uh, being part of our program. We have 21 exhibitors out there. We're excited to have those folks. Um, they bring something to the forum that's great, it gives us the ability to interact with some of those, those people and provides an additional networking opportunity. So if you haven't already, please um, take some deliberate time to, to visit our, our exhibitors. I wanted to thank Chris Kelder. Chris is gonna be up here, so you're gonna see him in a little bit. Uh, he is our program chair for this year. There's two committees that put on this, on, on this um, event. There's the planning committee and the program committee. Peter Pamkowski forever has been the planning um, committee chair and he is stepping down this year and we wanted to thank him very much for everything he's done. There's nothing I can say up here that, would, that I would be able to um, express to him the, the amount of work that he's done. He's done an, an unbelievable job. And Chris and his team have put on the program. So if you like the program, you should certainly go to Chris. And if you don't like the program, you should certainly go to Chris. Does that make sense? Right, Chris? Everything's going to be good, yeah. So thank you for that. Um, the Ag Society wouldn't happen without volunteers. It just wouldn't. And there's a tremendous amount of volunteers that are not only here today, but have helped throughout the year to put this on. Um, there's also some folks that we partner with to put this on. Um, many of you know Ann Noble Shepherd. She's over there in red. She doesn't want to be recognized ever, but I will, we'll let her do that. And without Ann and her team's work, this doesn't happen. Uh, we partnered with Ann se several years ago, and the amount of work that they do, not only to help us organize these events, um, but stay in compliance, engage our membership, um, help us raise money is, is phenomenal. And I wanted to make sure that, that she's recognized for that. Our focus is to continue our passion in enhancing networking and educational opportunities, and that's what our goal is, and that's what we're gonna to continue to do. In that vein, we have the, the ambassadors with us. For those who've been to the Ag Society over the last five, six, seven years, you know that the Ag Society Foundation was formed, and one of its primary focuses was um, an outreach to young individuals, folks between 18 and 25, who are looking to have a career in agriculture. And those ambassadors apply and then they run through a program, up till now has been led by Katie Carpenter and this year uh, Megan Clancy to help put on a program to help those people get engaged, network and meet some of the people in our industry. We had 11 ambassadors um, in our class this year. We have nine here with us. I'd like to ask those ambassadors to stand for me real quick. There they are. There's our class of ambassadors. Round of applause for those folks. I was gonna see how long you were gonna stand up, make it uncomfortable. Thanks very much for you guys being here. They have a little ambassador tag on their, on their name tag, and if you see them, uh, please engage them. Say hi, ask them where they're from. Many of um, those are, are local kids that are in college, or just out of college. Their, um, their, their mug shots and where they're from will be scrolling across the screen here, and please engage them. They're here because they have passion for agriculture, and they want to dedicate their lives to an agricultural career, and we want to help them do that. So please, uh, please spend some time to do that. We've got two more business pieces uh, set up. We have our treasurer's report and our nominating committee. Uh, Anthony Colangelo is our treasurer. He's unable to be here. He's also the treasurer for the Whittier Museum and the foundation, so he sends his regards. And in his uh, spot, we have Tim Vesey, who's the head of our audit committee, and he's gonna walk through our treasurer's report. Thank you, Mark. Um, the, uh, the Ag Society really is in pretty good shape and has been for the last several years. Um, if you look at our balance sheet at the end of the year, we had about $62,000 of total assets. Um, it really had, did not change significantly over the course of the last year. So we've been pretty stable for quite some time. Um, the income statement, <clears throat> we really break this down into two primary different things that we do. The first is the forum itself. So if you look at the total forum income uh, and the forum expense, you see that it was down fairly significantly last year on both sides because of the virtual program that we did last year. Um, but we still managed to net some income and what most of that money really represents is the 
sponsorship and membership um, uh, income that comes in as part of that annual uh, forum process. <clears throat> and then on the operating side, down at the bottom of the bottom of the page, um, that's really just for the most part our cost to run the run the society, do the newsletters, um, you know, the work that Ann does for us, uh, um, you know, just all of the administrative things that need to happen, and so that by the time we get done, uh, you know, this past year, even with uh, doing the virtual forum last year, we still wound up with three thousand dollars more coming in than what we needed to cover everything. So we felt really, really good about that. That's it. If you have any questions, come see me later. Thank you. Can I have a motion to accept uh, Tim's treasury report? So moved. Do I have a second? Um, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. I'm going to ask Jeanette uh, Carrere Haberling. Haberling? Haberling? Um, she's newly married, so I'm still trying to figure that out. She is the head of our governance and nominating committee, and she's going to have a report for us. Good morning, everyone. We all bring special talents and dedication to the mission of the New York State Ag Society. If you are interested, please let us know. We'd love to have you as part of our board or part of our committees. The nominating committee recommends the following slate of officers. President, Mark Majeliski. Vice President, Chris Kelder. Treasurer, Anthony, Anthony Colangelo. And Secretary, Katie Carpenter. There's some things I have to read. <laughs> nominations are now open from the floor. Are there any further nominations for our slate of officers? Hearing none, our slate of officers is carried. The nominating committee recommends the following board members to retain their board position for another three-year term. Mark Majaleski, Chris Kelder, Tim Vesey, Rick Zimmerman. The nominating committee also appreciates the time and service of those members who have decided to vacate their board seats, Judy Whitaker, Melissa Osgood, and our ambassador, Melissa Keller. The nominating committee nominates the following people to fill the three-year term of vacated board seats, Todd Lighthall and Christina Zick Dimitrov. And then in 2016, the board partnered with the ambassador program to create a student board position where the ambassadors can begin learning about board service. This is a two-year term. The nominating committee nominates the following student board member to fill that two-year board term, Alexis Payne. Nominations are now open from the floor. Are there any further nominations for the board or student board? Hearing none, that is carried. You want me to vote? Sure. Okay. Um, can I have a motion to accept the slate of officers as pushed forth? forth? Thank you, Barb. That was a little awkward for a second there. Do I have a second? Great, thank you, Katie. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried, thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. I just wanna also thank the nominating committee of Rick Zimmerman, Katie Carpenter, and Dick Church for their time and dedication in selecting the best candidates for these roles. If you are interested again, please let me know. Thank you so much. Okay, I will just reiterate, I know it's easy to say from up here, um, we are a volunteer organization and without folks who want to dedicate some time to our boards, uh, it makes it hard for us to do what we do. There's been a lot of folks um, who have spent a tremendous amount of time on the board. Um, we have continued to adapt and change and one of the things that was approved by the board yesterday in our meeting was some term limits for our boards of directors. You're going to get notice of that over the next year, and then at next forum, we are going to vote on it. The idea of term limits is not to get the people who are in there out. The idea of term limits is to make sure that we continue to have fresh ideas and we continue to be relevant to our audience. So um, stay tuned. You'll get some, some stuff over the, next, over the next year, and next year we'll vote on these uh, term, li term limits, which is a change to our bylaw. 
If you have any desire or passion to serve and be part of our organization, I would ask you to let somebody with a little board of the directors um, tag no or Ann over there in the red, in the red um, jacket, and we'd love to have you. There are lots of committees as well as the board where you can volunteer. I will tell you that from time to time, we get someone who comes in and says, I'd like to help. And then we maybe lose track of that, and that's our fault. But please, please do it again. If you've asked once and you haven't heard from us, continue to ask, uh, because we do want your help. And if you know somebody who, can, uh, who may be a good fit for us, please let us know. We're always looking for good people to join, join our organization. Okay, I would like to introduce our program chair and vice president, Chris Kelder. He gave me this long introduction on him. That's not true. He said, I would like you to say that I'm a fruit and vegetable farmer outside of Ulster County, where he and his family farm, and that's what you get. Chris is a great guy. We're excited to have him as our program chair, Chris Kelder. Thank you, Mark. Now the fun begins. We did all the business, now we can have some fun. Okay, what to expect today? Awards will be presented throughout the course of the day. The photo schedule for winners and sponsors is printed in the program. So if you can, you can follow that, that would be great. Music will indicate when to exit and enter this room. So listen for the new song. Um, we do have to leave this room so they can reset it for lunch. To ask questions to our speakers, Look for index cards on your table, raise your hands, and the ambassadors will assist, you, assist that process and get the cards out to us. It can't be underestimated the importance of the foundation's support to conduct this program. So please look on the inside cover of your program and use the QR code to make a gift if you so desire. A.J. Kimimura is a third generation produce grower and shipper from Orange County, California. From 2003 to 2010, he served as the Secretary of California Department of Food and Agriculture. He is a founding co-chair of Solutions from the Land, a nationally recognized nonprofit that is developing innovative and sustainable climate spark collaborations for the 21st century. He serves on multiple boards and advisory committees including the Farm Foundation, Western Growers, Roots of Peace, CSU Agricultural Research Institute, Board of Governors, Ag Advisory Committee for the Chicago Council, Bipartisan Policy Center, Ag and Forestry Task Force, Advisory Council for the Honors of Harvest. Wow, for over 40 years, AG has pursued a lifelong goal to work toward the end of hunger and malnutrition. Locally, he is the founding chair of Solutions for Urban Ag. He has worked closely with regional food banks and stakeholders to create exciting urban and um, hunger and education advanced food systems. As a progressive farmer, Mr. Kaminora has a lifetime experience working within the shrinking rural and urban boundaries of Southern California. AG graduated with a BA from University of California, Berkeley, and was a member of class 20 of the California Ag Leadership Program. Mr. Kawamura, welcome. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me? First order? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. It's, uh, unfortunate that I, I am not standing in front of you and uh, sometimes uh, I think all of us that are in agriculture we recognize that when the weather turns uh, you uh, know that you have unpredictability in fact uh, when we talk about unpredictable weather the one thing we do know it's uh, unpredictable weather means unpredictable harvest it also means unpredictable uh, schedules on a, a flights across the country so um, my uh, apologies for not being there in person, although thank you to Anne uh, Noble Shepherd for being uh, wonderfully resilient and, uh, uh, and nimble uh, in, able to, in being able to put, put this together like this. So let's go ahead and just, we'll get started here. Um, I have a presentation right here. Uh, I think I'm sharing my screen. Well, it's all good. Is it moving? You're all ready. Yep. Okay. You're sharing. Okay. 
uh, you know, on my screen here, it doesn't seem to be moving. As always, do we have the best laid plans here? Let me just see if I'm doing something. Hit the space barrel, space, <laughs> hit the space bar in the right arrow or right arrow. There we go. Yay. Okay. Well, <laughs> I think as we all recognize that uh, those of us, I, I'm a baby boomer, I was born in 1956 uh, and, and came through our uh, public school systems all the way through. Um, we were told in history class and uh, uh, for many, many years that the, the history of agriculture is uh, some 10,000 years old, going back to the, uh, the rivers of the Euphrates and the Tigris. And we were told that for many, many years. Of course, we uh, have heard recently in the last decade or so uh, partly because of the new uh, technologies with carbon dating that suddenly that number for uh, civilizations and, and uh, agricultural endeavor on the planet have uh, somehow gone to 30,000 years ago. And, and that's quite a leap uh, backwards or forwards, depending on how you want to look at it. Because if we've been on the planet, uh, changing our environment, looking for a predictable food supply, uh, using uh, the technologies of the day or of the of the century or of the millennia to look at uh, food supplies and dealing with everything from climate to pests to, uh, to diseases. Uh, we recognize that that advance and that collapse is, is something that we've experienced on this planet as a civilization driven by how efficient and how uh, ready prepared we are for those changes in, in the way we might produce a food supply. And looking at the enormous knowledge and technologies that would have to, would have had to be transferred over time. I think we also recognize that look at how many, uh, how much knowledge and how many uh, technologies and how many techniques have been lost to us over those 30,000 years. And who knows if it's uh, 100,000 years, we don't know. But the, the idea that uh, moving forward from today, uh, this idea of, of an agricultural renaissance, which is the what I'd like to talk to you about today, this 21st century agricultural renaissance, um, is, is the center point of understanding that we have come a long way in our agricultural endeavors on this planet, and we have a long way to go, especially now that we recognize that our population is moving from the seven point something billion people to uh, nine billion. Um, this idea that uh, agriculture is driven by uh, governments, it's driven by uh, entrepreneurial uh, trade, it's driven by all the different motivators that uh, allow for a predictable food supply. Um, it, it, it becomes very easy for us to understand that when we create abundance, uh, then we can be living, the minute we move into a world or a region of scarcity, we start edging towards and moving towards uh, uh, a kind of um, survival, if you will. The difference between living and survival is, is driven then by that abundance. And as we look at this idea that in the 21st century, uh, we have an, a, a tremendous uh, amount of changes, uh, a cascade of changes, an avalanche of new thinking. There's so much going on and so much so that we can look at our, our world as, as if it's not as, not as much as theories are changing, but now we have a change of theory. We have a new way of looking at uh, the existence of mankind on this planet and how it must uh, really start to become more resilient, more sustainable, um, uh, and fit into the mold, if you will, of a, of a civilization, a global civilization that has all the intention and all the possibility, and more importantly, the potential to move forward uh, and, and thrive. Um, so often, if we look at this uh, challenge of, of abundance. Uh, I, I look around our, our nation, and, and it isn't amazing how many different cuisines we're uh, being exposed to now. You know, just uh, again, 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, uh, you didn't see so many cuisines out there. Yes, you had your Chinese food, your Japanese food, maybe uh, you had your Mexican food a if you were down along the borders. Um, and certainly Italian foods and all the other kind of foods. But today you have Vietnamese, you have Korean, you have all kinds of South African and not South African, but African foods, Central American foods. It's really amazing that we live in this world of abundance. And it's the abundance then that uh, is the driver behind so much. And as we have, uh, has often been noted, uh, an enormous opportunity for 
uh, billions of people to start to change their diets, to move towards a healthier kind of eating. Uh, I'm gonna address that later as we talk about the difference between hunger uh, or food scarcity or nutrition scarcity um, or insecurity. Uh, I'd like to talk about that and some other topics as well as we look at this agricultural renaissance that we're involved in. Um, this idea that the planet is shrinking or growing or expanding, it just is a simple uh, equation. There's X amount of people on a the planet. There's X amount of resources to work with. There's X amount of production uh, in terms of calories that's going to have to take place on a daily basis. And then the logistics to move those calories around is the next challenge for us. And it is true in this last hundred years, just this last hundred years, for the first time really in the history of the planet, uh, mankind has built the capacity to feed everybody on the planet. But um, we all recognize that for many different reasons, we, we choose not to feed everybody on the planet. We have the capacity to do so, but we don't necessarily have the will to do so. And, and some of the changes that we see coming uh, in these decades ahead and actually immediately since, uh, even since this COVID pandemic has taken place, we recognize that there's a new way of looking at things, this change of theory. Uh, so often, if you look at the world through a certain lens, um, that lens year after year, decade after decade, let's say century after century, the pictures always seems to be about the same, but when you change the lens, uh, your vision changes. Uh, it, you can see things differently. And what we see right now is the blinders are off. Maybe it's because of the pandemic, maybe because it's uh, just the fact that it's 2022. I, I love the fact that your organization is 190 years old, going back to 1832 you know, if you if you think about it, that's not that long ago. Um, I want to talk about these uh, sustainable development goals in just a minute, but I wanted to just go to this picture first. Um, if your association is 190 years old, um, I have a friend who I, I farm with next door. He just retired this last year. He was born in 1925. Uh, and at uh, 96 years old, 97 this next year, he just retired. He remembers the names of uh, horses he used to uh, plow his fields with as a 14, 15 year old kid, um, 13, 14, 15 year old kid. And he even knows the names. There was Baldy, there's Claude, and there's Dotty. Uh, and, and, and I mean, Dolly, I'm sorry, Dolly. And, and he was saying to me that uh, in his time, uh, the Japanese American, uh, the Japanese uh, vegetable growers in his region, he was growing dry beans uh, in, in the Los Angeles area. Uh, but they'd come and borrow this small horse. The other two horses, Claude and Baldy, were big draft horses, but they'd come and borrow this little horse. This is not a picture of Dolly, by the way. This is a, a man that taught me how to farm. But uh, they borrowed Dolly because she had small feet. and She wouldn't step on the plants. And I was thinking, well, that's a good example of precision agriculture, if I've ever seen one. Um, this idea that this, the, we were just doing this hundred year, less than 100 years ago, if that's not a kind of a sign of what kind of transformation has taken place, um, it, it, you'd have to be sleeping, I guess, like Rip Van Winkle, uh, and you'd wake up and you might notice that there's significant changes. And the changes that we're having right now um, are profound. They're, they're so exciting, at the same time terrifying for some. Uh, we'll see that many times this idea that change is good. Uh, we recognize that there's a lot of people that are uncomfortable with change, and we'll talk about that a little bit later today as well. But let me go back to this slide. Uh, many of you would remember, uh, many of you might not remember because I'm not sure what the age of the crowd is, but in 1985, uh, 1985, 15 years ahead of the turn of the century, 1985, the United Nations came out with a modest set of goals called the Millennial Goals. And they included things like reducing uh, child mortality at, at birth. They included uh, uh, improving education for kids. They included uh, uh, reducing hunger and its, and its effects around the planet. And all the nations of the world that were part of the United Nations signed on. And amazingly, in the year 2000, uh, they announced that those modest goals, the millennial goals, had been accomplished on the planet. There had been significant reductions in child mortality, in hunger as a percentage of the total population. There were great improvements in education. And you started to see in the year 2000 that there was a, a great movement towards a just really a better uh, situation for mankind on the planet. Well, in, 19, uh, in 2015, the United Nations came out then with an, uh, yet another set of goals. 
uh, they call them the sustainable development goals. And I always ask the question, but I can't see all of you in the audience right now. But I would ask everybody in the audience, how many of you have heard of the sustainable development goals? And in most of the speeches over the last, again, these goals were, were put out in 2015. Um, and, and most of the audiences over these last several years, when you ask how many people know about these sustainable development goals, the majority of the people in the audience, maybe 90%, don't know what they are. They've never even heard of them. And yet, if you go to Europe, if you go to other countries, a lot of people understand that these are goals that their countries have signed up on and want to try and accomplish amazingly by the year 2030. Now, when you look at these goals uh, individually, one by one, you think, wow, that's a pretty aggressive or pretty uh, ambi ambitious set of goals. In fact, geez, how are you going to accomplish some of these goals? They seem a little more wide-eyed uh, optimism than, than you can imagine. And yet, as you look through the goals and you look at them one at a time and you say, wow, that would be quite an amazing thing if we could accomplish these goals uh, by the year 2030, which, by the way, is only eight years away, right, now that we're in year 2022, um, you'd say, wow, if we could accomplish these goals, the world would be incredibly different. In fact, the world would be significantly different, profoundly different. And, and what's holding us up to actually see if we can't make these goals happen? Then if you look at the goals closer, you'll recognize, and this is probably the most eye-opening thing for many of us, many of the folks that we get to work with at our group called Solutions from the Land and many of the other groups that are out there looking at a, a path forward for agriculture. You go, wait a minute poverty, hunger, uh, dealing with water, dealing with energy, dealing with uh, sustainable cities, dealing with life on the land, life below the water, uh, dealing with climate. Uh, all of these goals that are on here, not all of them, but so many of them have a lot to do with agriculture, so much so. Uh, responsible consumption would be a good example, but so much so you realize that you can't accomplish these goals if agriculture is doing poorly. And maybe that's the center point of my talk today is if agriculture is doing poorly on the planet, we have, again, 30,000 years of, of, of learning, I guess, or, or memory, if we don't erase it all, to say that if agriculture is doing poorly on the planet, the planet can't go forward. Civilization can't go forward. In fact, we just say the simple four words, uh, successful agriculture sustains civilization. Very simple, but it's very real. And this idea that looking at these goals and how how exciting uh, it would be if countries around the world started to compete, compete with each other to see who could accomplish these goals first within their country. That gets you to a point where we're not dealing with politics anymore. Uh, and we're not necessarily dealing with one policy fits all. You're dealing with the concept that if a sustainable world could be put, woven together, I like to use the world, the, the, the concept of a quilt. Uh, we know what a quilt is. You have a lot of different pieces and it looks like pieces until you weave them together. And the idea that we can create innovative collaboration and start to approach these different goals, uh, not one at a time, uh, not two at a time, but three or four at a time, because that's the way you would approach and achieve these goals. Uh, in the past, I think through that, the centuries before us, and certainly in the last century, you started to see um, maybe the thing that was hurting us so much was being caught in our silos of thinking, or our, our, again, our, our vision of our as far as what we thought was possible was limited because uh, of the lens that we were looking through. And so often we saw so many organizations uh, working in these silos on these different, these different goals uh, and hoarding the money that was available to help the goal uh, be accomplished instead of collaboratively innovating and, and aligning resources to accomplish multiple goals at the same time. And I would tell you that I am excited. Uh, you know, I look at it, the world myself. I look look at it as a, with a glass half full. Uh, and so many people say, "Well, a glass half empty, glass half full." What does that mean? What it means is that the pitcher that's going to be pouring stuff into your glass. If you don't understand what's in the pitcher, you don't know if you're having a glass half full, half empty. You don't know what the potentiality of the future is because. There's so much exciting things happening in the world of technology, in the world of new thinking, in the world of collaborative innovation, in the world of uh, just realigning, if you will, uh, our presence on a planet. That's what's happening in, in, in lightning speed. And again, if you use that term renaissance, it means there's a rebirth, there's a, there's a new age of thinking, there's a new enlightenment, if you will, another way to look at the world. 
I use a quote by Mark Twain all the time because it's, it is one of my favorite quotes, and I really like Mark Twain because he's just uh, 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 has always was a was a great disruptor of many things and. Um, I'm sure you've heard of many of his quotes, especially the one about whiskey uh, is for uh, drinking and waters for fighting. Of course, that's a California slogan, I think now. But the idea that uh, Mark Twain made this, this statement that you can't trust your judgment if your imagination is out of focus. Uh, for all of us, I think in this century and at this time, we want to basically put that new lens on uh, get a new vision of what's possible. And as our imagination then is allowed to uh, embrace these new concepts and these new ideas and these new ways of thinking, not because they're um, unique or novel, they there are proof of concept activities all over the world that have been kind of leading us down a path where we start to see that the possibilities are enormous, that the opportunities for tremendous uh, leaps forward uh, are, are everywhere. And so going back to this, uh, let me just talk about this idea of new thinking, new imagination, new tools uh, that come about on a, my own farm. Uh, in my lifetime, so I've got 40 something, 42, 43, 44 seasons under my belt uh, as a farmer, and the stewardship on our ranches, we're one of those unique ones for the last 30 years, we haven't owned the land that we farm on. So we're, we lease ground. We lease ground from anybody that will let us have some properties in a very urban area of Southern California, just south of Disneyland mostly. So I farm on a military base, I, uh, an active naval weapon station. I farm on an abandoned military base. I farm on under the power lines. I farmed on schools. I farmed on university campuses. I farmed on um, basically if we see weeds growing on a large vacant lot, we ask who the landowner is. And we we kind of know at least if the weeds are growing, it'll probably grow a pretty good crop. Then you start looking for a water hydrant or some kind of water. And for us, the, uh, those of us that grow fruits and vegetables, those are the combinations you need. You need good soil, you need access to water uh, that's not too expensive. And of course you need uh, um, the idea that you have a marketplace nearby. Um, but on my farm, I remember very clearly, we went from in, uh, in some cases, flood irrigation to furrow irrigation. We then went to sprinklers. Uh, I remember we were not the early adapters in our farm. We looked over the fence and we would see other guys switching into these different technologies. And we went from sprinklers and then we went to drip irrigation. And in the area of strawberries, I'm a strawberry producer and shipper. Um, we, we, we saw some tremendous advances in, in the tools that we could use to get a better crop of strawberries out. Um, We've, we've looked at, uh, uh, in our area, we uh, use reclaim water for the last uh, 30 years on several ranches, and that's a, a tertiary treated water, but that's been our water supply that's uh, been allowed to us in an area that is uh, basically a desert. If you look at the regular terms, we get 12, 14 inches, let's say 14 inches of rain annually in our area. So it's a very dry area, but because of the development of water we've been at, we've had tremendous access to water. Um, we've done a tremendous amount of, uh, of innovation on our farms in terms of automation just rec recently in this idea of going from um, going from uh, uh, a horse and plow to John Deere just announced that they have their first automated tractor, autonomous tractors uh, ready to go on the marketplace. These, these are the kind of times we're living in. Uh, I wanna remind the people that as I'm farming in Southern California, uh, I, we've had experiences of drought, we've had experiences of flooding, I've had experiences uh, of uh, severe uh, unexpected uh, rainstorms only because we, the weather channel was not as good as it is today. Um, all of us that watch the weather channel regularly, it's amazing that you get 24-7 uh, coverage and great, great graphics talk telling, uh, telling you what's going to happen uh, with the different pressure zones and the way the, these storms are coming in and going out. But this idea that uh, we have a modern agricultural system right now um, and we have all these tools, that means nothing uh, when it comes to some of these extreme weather events that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, and we're dealing with in, in, the, in the present and into the future. Uh, I can tell you in California, um, if we were to not, if the, currently we're having some pretty good rains, but if we, the rains stop and we end up with yet another fifth year of doubt, sixth year of doubt, if we get up to seven, eight, nine, ten, 
the wheels start to come off because we haven't done the investment in infrastructure that we need uh, for a predictable long-term drought. And you'll start to see some of the biggest challenges we have. And that also includes some of the enormous challenges we have with depending on the, the Colorado River watershed and the headlands of the Colorado River. Uh, when you see unhealthy forests, when you see uh, uh, catastrophic fires in those forests and you see the forests not functioning the way they should be both in California and from the Sierras all the way up to the Cascades, you start to realize that we have a lot of work to do and we know better and we have the, will, that we have some tools to work with, but now we have to find the will to go get the, those into place and help change uh, and, and improve those forests so they function to make sure that we have a predictable supply of water. Um, this idea that uh, drought, uh, that pestilence, that diseases um, are kind of vanquished by the modernism that we have today, that we have um, different machines that protect us from frost and freezes. That's partly true, but it also is very true that um, when you have 7.8, soon to be 8 billion people on the planet, and all the different systems on the planet are uh, at any point in time vulnerable to any kinds of disruptions. I think what we recognize in a second is um, our, food our food supply as a world is not predictable, but if we can focus on producing abundance, that gives us that backup supply to be able to move food around. And certainly we saw a lot of that during the pandemic. Um, in our lifetime at my farm, we were always looking for different uh, uh, different ways to do things. Uh, we have extremely expensive water in Southern California, as much as uh, for those of you who would understand, because uh, I know New York has a lot of water. Uh, you can share it with us someday, but it's a long ways to pipe it. Uh, but we, we're paying as much as $1,000 an acre foot now in some areas. Uh, I've heard in the San Joaquin Valley, because of the current drought, uh, in fact, I just talked with an almond producer recently, he's uh, buying some water for 2000 bucks an acre foot as, as an augmentation to the supply he already has, and it's just remarkably expensive. And for those crops that don't have that kind of margin, for profitability, you basically stop producing them. Uh, there's a sad story right now in the San Juan, in the in the in the Coachella and Imperial Valley that has taken place in in nothing more than a decade. Uh, we had almost 27,000 acres of uh, table grapes in that valley, but because of not so much the unavailability of water, there's plenty of water there, but the high cost of labor. Uh, we from 27,000 acres of table grapes, we're down to less than 2,000 acres of table grapes now. Uh, 30 years ago, we had uh, over 35, 4, 35 plus thousand acres of asparagus, and now there's almost none, uh, maybe 100 acres of asparagus in that valley. But that production has gone into Mexico following cheaper labor. So whether it's expensive water, whether it's cheaper labor, whether it's really expensive rent, uh, in, in the area I farm, some of the land is, uh, we pay as much as $3,000 a year an acre for straw, good strawberry ground. And that's the same price that you would pay in parts of Ventura and Oxnard and even up all the way up to Watsonville, uh, up, up, up the coast in California. And so these are enormous costs. If you can imagine that you got $3,000 for uh, rent, you have $2,000 plus for water, you got $5,000 an acre just for water and rent before you even plant the crop that you know you're gonna have. And these are kind of the drivers for what's happening in, in many of our areas because the next expensive cost is labor. And so something like this, this hydroponic system for strawberries, it's much easier to pick. Uh, it didn't perform the way we want it, so we've not, we're not doing it, but there's a lot of folks that are looking at these kind of systems currently and, uh, and moving them indoors as well to create more predictability of their harvest. Um, I mentioned that if, when you, if you can use your imagination a lot, uh, whether, whether you're uh, farming in an urban area or of course out in the, the peri-urban areas, there's a lot of land available. I, I mentioned that I lease most of my ground. This is, was an abandoned golf course um, that is, uh, we put into strawberries. It's some of the best ground I've ever farmed on. Of course, it was on, under uh, uh, the turf of a golf course for about 40 years at the edge of a military base that was shut down. And then it sat idle for several years. And then we were able to come in here and just kind of immediately realize that this is a hell of a piece of ground and uh, put some strawberries in here. Um, currently it's houses. So uh, in our area, the cost of an acre of land 
Uh, I wish I owned all these acres, but we're seeing land as much as $3 million an acre in Orange County is what the value of this land is. So growing strawberries or growing vegetables as an interim activity is pretty much the fate of what we have. And yet we're thankful for the landlords that let us farm on their property because when we're on their property, we do weed abatement, we do rodent control, we do erosion control, we do a lot of things and that's a value to the landlord. And so any open piece of ground anywhere in the world uh, basically has value if agriculture is on it. And we recognize that the challenges and the pressures of development are always going to be there, especially if you're in an urban area. And that's basically what uh, is a driver for so many folks to pick up cash out and move to another area and move their operations someplace else. But I just wanted to mention that your imagination, uh, if you're looking at a resurgence and a, a buildup of what urban agriculture can be, I, uh, many times people say, oh, you're an urban farmer. And I say, well, yeah, kind of, but I'm also a farmer in an urban area. We've just learned to be very resilient in, in looking at what, how we might farm. Um, that abandoned Air Force base that we got to farm on and we're still farming on parts of it, um, this is perfect example. This is what, when you fly into an airport, there's always a open uh, runways um, and uh, the land in between the runways is generally maintained with grass on it so that it can absorb water when the heavy rains come because an airport doesn't want water on the runways. So the engineering that goes into building any airport is actually pretty good. The level is right. The, the ability to uh, grow things is amazing how good the sum of the ground is. And of course, they always choose airports. They usually put them on the flattest, nicest piece of ground. So the ground underneath uh, that that kind of endeavors actually can be pretty pretty darn good. Um, this idea that uh, uh, we're moving forward at a at a clip that just boggles your mind uh, from that uh, that horse driven plow to a satellite guided uh, uh, um, tractor. Um, we are living during these times, and again, within a hundred year span, the advances that we're seeing and the advances that are coming down the pipe or that are already here, these are the things that I think we start looking at, especially those of us that are growing the fruits and vegetables, but even if you're growing grains, even if you're in the dairy business, uh, there are robotics that are taking place both at the dairy and out in the fields. I, I can't wait to have my first chance to buy a robot, uh, robotic autonomous weeding machine, weeder, weeder. Uh, that can take out weeds because that's an enormously expensive operation for those of us that grow fruits and vegetables. Um, the next step of where our imagination takes us then uh, it goes to wherever our imagination uh, will take us. Uh, we, we, we can see that uh, what we thought was impossible uh, suddenly now we say, oh, maybe it's feasible. You know, we've gone from mapping our fields to mapping Mars, to, uh, you know, the moon now mapping our uh, human genome. Uh, we're going in two directions, both into the universe, out towards the universe, and then, then down into the universe inside of, a, inside of the molecular arena. And pulling these new tools, uh, it's just creating a more dynamic toolbox for agriculture. It's a more dynamic system of ways that you may go about producing a food supply because ultimately we all understand that the management of resources, the sustainable management of resources, water, uh, sunlight, uh, and, and the space that you'd have to, to work with it, the minerals, uh, allow us to grow things in really uh, interesting places and um, the capacity to produce food in novel ways. We're seeing that take place everywhere. Maybe it's a little bit more in the fruit and vegetable sector, but it's, it's not necessarily because the oceans have been barely tapped, the ability to grow, uh, whether it's seaweed, kelp, the, uh, the, all the different kinds of protein products that can come out through the oceans, uh, the way that forest, uh, forest and forestry products are still being developed. It's just an exciting time. Um, I get a chance uh, when I was fortunate to be uh, the secretary out in California, uh, you might know there's over 400 different specialty crops grown out there and it's, the numbers going up, that's commercial crops that are being grown. And uh, the imagination is enormous, you know, and whether it's uh, new foods uh, that are taking place, whether it's mushrooms, whether it's a uh, uh, grubs, earthworms, things that you eat. These are protein sources, uh, uh, the crickets, the kinds of things that are being eaten. Uh, it, it's amazing. And then there's the other 
tidal wave of old foods that are now new foods. I'm sure many of you have been eating a lot of Brussels sprouts when uh, 40 years ago, you didn't want to touch a Brussels sprout. Well, maybe some of you would. Uh, and, and things like kale, things like all the different new products that have been out there for a long time that are starting to enter into the general food supply and become just normal products that you see all the time, partly driven by nutrition, partly driven by new ways to approach them and cook them. This is a, a barrel with a light uh, a modified barrel and the crops grow around the light and they circle the light. If you were to cut this and lay it open, you'd need another light. But by putting in these barrels, uh, this is Omega Garden, a, a kind of a local uh, Canadian firm that has uh, been putting really interesting things out there for home production. But you can imagine then uh, that's a guy standing there down on the bottom, I think. But this ability to, to, to scale up uh, replicate and scale up or scale down as the case might be is part of the hallmark of where our 21st century renaissance is taking us there's all kinds of ways to think that production of foods for certain foods are, are going to be uh, in a revolutionary way uh, rethought and reimagined and re and put into place we see that with lettuce we see that with other things you can imagine this system like a bunch of like the, can, uh, the cans inside of a coke machine uh, uh, a soft drink machine um, they can be rotated, they can be slip pushed out, and they just they move along these uh, serpentine belts and different kinds of belts. And you start to see that there's all kinds of ways to think about what's possible and what's uh, uh, feasible. The minute we talk about what's feasible, they become more possible and probable, and they become commercialized much faster than ever before. This is a system of a belt moving within a, a warehouse. 28 feet tall, uh, and then they were growing all kinds of sprouts and uh, wheatgrass. Um, there's a lot of failure rate with some of these new novel technologies, but that's always the same. The, the early adapters, the early adopters sometimes don't get the full benefit of all those, all those folks that are putting their, pouring their dollars in to get these systems right. And, and of course, the vulnerability of these systems, although they're inside Although it's closed environment, although that's the idea is that it's a more predictable season or year round food supply, they still have the same different but extreme vulnerabilities to the diseases that can get inside to water contamination, to an earthquake, to a, a software or a malfunction or a hijacking of your software, and all of a sudden your whole system goes down. And again, anything that's growing inside of the building obviously needs a backup system, needs another backup system, and these, uh, these thoughts that you're going to take a highly perishable crop and, and produce them uh, comes with always comes with some jeopardy. But these systems are everywhere. The older systems that have been out there, but people just aren't aware just how far they've come, like the tomato industry, uh, over 50, 60 percent of the uh, the vine ripe tomato industry, as you know, comes, as we all should know, comes from indoor uh, closed environment systems. The Dutch have perfected many. There's many out here in the United States that have pulled these together. And it's just as uh, incredible how these systems have been up and running for so long. And now with the, the advanced uh, technologies in robotics and, and the ability for the robotic uh, uh, arms to pick and select and to use all the different site uh, um, um, applications, um, we're seeing that whether it's this or with strawberries, uh, there's a tremendous new um, excitement around how many of these uh, indoor operations can be situated right next to the distribution center, whether it's a Costco, whether it's a Walmart, whether it's a Kroger, it's, that's exactly what's happening. Or the food service institutes themselves, uh, the food service businesses themselves are finding that they can scale these things down and put in their own restaurant, their own lettuce growing operation, their own uh, fruit, uh, different kinds of fruit growing operations. So they have fresh stuff, uh, maybe even aquaculture, where the fish and the fruit and the vegetables are harvested that day and put on the table that afternoon. These are the kinds of things that are happening. Uh, and these are the kinds of opportunities, whether it's for the large distribution uh, food chain that we need uh, that we have out supply chain that we have, or at your own home, the idea that you can now scale down and produce quite a bit of uh, nutrient dense foods and proteins right in your own home and your backyard. Uh, these are all things that we're excited about. And this idea that how would you transform then uh, uh, urban areas uh, and, and create uh, edible landscapes in all places. Uh, I, I'm fortunate to be a part of a small uh, uh, nonprofit that's been up and running for 30 years. 
uh, 35 years, um, we have a saying uh, basically uh, in our region saying we want to see edible landscapes everywhere with hunger nowhere. And for 30 years, my nonprofit is called Solutions uh, for Urban Agriculture, and it's a subset, if you will, it's kind of the urban, subs uh, uh, the urban subset of solutions from the land. Uh, what we've been doing with our, our local nonprofit is we've been working collaboratively with the food banks for over 30, 35 years doing gleaning where we get the local populations to come out and glean our fields. And then on top of that now, we have uh, 30 years ago, we started custom growing food for the food bank at, at three to four acres every year. Now, that sounds exciting and that sounds good. And it, we had... Uh, good intentions of agriculture education, good intentions of creating small academies for, uh, for, vac for veterans, for example. Um, and we started to see that within a, a community, there was this desire and the food bank certainly had a desire for fresh farm products. And the challenge with, the, with, with food banks these days is we had got into, I mentioned siloed thinking, I also mentioned the lack of imagination. Somehow in delivering food, our, our food products to the most in, food insecure in our nation, we have become very uh, accustomed to the thought that our, our out of uh, uh, expired food products, our rejected food products, our products that don't sell, the products that are, are, are discounted and, and, and end of life, uh, we send that over to the food bank and we think we should be pretty proud that that's eliminating waste of some sort, uh, but it's providing the, the nutrients uh, or the calories, let's say, for the under, underserved. And we started to say that because of the pandemic, I think it helped us maybe rethink uh, just how severe some of our food, des food deserts are. It, started, it helped us rethink just how underserved in terms of nutrition delivery uh, the, the food insecure in our nation are, and you're starting to see a tremendous amount of attention around uh, nutrient dense foods being a part of a, a more healthy individual. We know that a kid that goes to school hungry is not a great student. We know that a kid that goes to school amped up on just so much sugar. A friend of mine was telling me that uh, some of the kids show up and they have two, two slices of bread with marshmallows spread inside of it. And that's the lunch for the kid for the day. You start to think, what in the world are we thinking when we know a lot more about uh, what's right and wrong for the nutrition of our children? And so um, let me do this. Let me play this small uh, video here uh, of, of project. I mentioned that for all these years, for 30 years, we've been growing three, four, five acres a year for our regional food bank. And this year, while we were sitting and talking and responding to the pandemic and understanding that some of the great new programs that USDA put into uh, place, Secretary Vilsack was, was right on top of putting this uh, program called Farm to Family. It's a food box family that in that food box comes a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables and some protein products as well from the farm and they deliver it right to the recipients. And in that box is a, just a great package of nutrient dense foods. We started to see that, well, that's a hell of a project. And, let me um, let let me before I put this start this. Let me tell this one quick story, uh, and I think I'm doing okay with time. Uh, yes. But, but yes. So in March of 2020, I got a phone call uh, from a friend of mine, uh, worried about uh, a, a, a fellow friend out in the in the um, Imperial uh, Valley down in Southern California, out in the desert. And because of the shutdown of the food service industry, that enormous unprecedented disruption in the global food supply, because of that shutdown, his company set, sent most of his products to the food service industry, to the restaurants and the, and the food service folks. And he was disking down uh, with a, one tractor and a disc, hundreds of acres of romaine, of lettuce, of broccoli, because there was no place for it to go. His refrigerators were full of products that he had that, that already had packed, but there was no place to send them in the early days of March 2020. This was taking place all over the world, all over the planet, that you had this disruption and you had nowhere to go for all these crops that were needed to be harvested, needed to be uh, put in play. 
And in, with that phone call, they had heard that I'd been doing a lot of work with the food banks and the, the simple call was, can you help him move some of his products? And so we made a call to our friends at the food banks. Uh, my company, we sell to the chain stores. And so we never missed a beat. We were selling all of our products without interruption to the chain stores. Um, it's just different companies, different setups for the way we run our businesses. But those who were really uh, um, aligned with the food service industry were the ones that got clobbered at first. So my friend is, is disking his fields down. He's just about at his wits end. And we lined him up with some food banks. And he was busy then within an eight-day period trying to create a way to get his products uh, off of each box and put them into another box and then get them out the door and try and sell something or give it away if he could find some compensation of any sort to at least get away from destroying all these crops. At the same time, I got a call from a friend out of Washington uh, who represented the Navajo Nation. And the Navajo Nation, he told me, uh, on the reservations, they were in an enormous crisis where they were out of food. It wasn't they didn't have, many of us saw that we had less choices in, in the stores that we went to. Um, but in many places, these food deserts and these other areas, when the convenience store and the liquor store and the restaurant shut down, there's no food uh, for hundreds of miles around uh, in many cases. And so the, 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 the request and the cry for some help came out of this group. And the Navajo Nation group called and said, we just, we need food. What can you do? Can you help us? And uh, my friend uh, Steve was saying, well, we're putting together this program. We're waiting for the USDA to get the details right. And, and the folks from the Navajo Nation said, we have money. Forget about the program. We have money. We can buy things. Can you send us something? And so within record time, within those first eight days, Steve is sending a semi-load uh, with boxes with all kinds of great veggies in it fresh veggies and it's showing up in the middle of nowhere on a reservation in New Mexico at an intersection and there at the intersection there's 50 pickup trucks waiting for uh, the truck to stop they open the doors they pull, pull out the products put them in the pickup trucks and deliver them to the households in the region and the families are receiving these boxes of fresh produce and the, the, the women are weeping uh, because they've never ever seen such fresh produce they're at the end of the food chain instead of the front of the food chain, and they'd never seen such beautiful fresh produce. And, and as the story started to continue to just accelerate, we started to see, wow, here's a different way to look at how we might address hunger in our time, how we might uh, address food insecurity and nutrition and healthy lives in our time. Here's a different way that we might realign a lot of different resources and create a better program. And maybe we have to give Amazon thanks, or maybe we have to give the thought that you can deliver so many things these days. You, you, know, you open the door and there it is on your front doorstep. And uh, you know, I have to look, look at my wife and say, you know, I think she has Santa Claus syndrome because uh, you know, I, I pull in the box and it goes, oh, look, someone's, somebody sent us something. I wonder what it is. But this idea that um, um, the ability and the logistics of delivering really fresh products and to a different kind of clientele is pretty exciting. So let me just show you this video really quickly and uh, we'll go from there. Hold on. And so with, a, with just a, a shift in our imagination, if you will, uh, and a shift in uh, appreciating all the resources we have in our area that could be pulled together, this, uh, this, this farm right here actually is uh, our, our uh, University of California land grant uh, research station down in Southern California. I'm going to, uh, I know 
that all of us around the nation in every state has uh, research station properties and open properties that are owned by either the universities or the state universities, or of course the government in, in many different places or by cities or by counties. And in this open land that's available then, we know that the cost of having just abandoned, abandoned ground with weeds growing on them, it, it incurs a cost. There's weed abatement, there's rodent control, there's people dump stuff on properties. In the case of a research station, uh, they have to keep the weeds off, they have to keep the ground looking good, but if there's not that many research projects, why is the ground sitting idle when you could potentially realign a lot of resources and move forward? So this program, which is now in our uh, seventh week of harvest, uh, we're delivering 40,000 pounds of vegetables, uh, it's cabbage, celery, and broccoli, uh, uh, to the food bank every week. Uh, all of it is planted by volunteers, weeded by mostly volunteers, and, and harvested by volunteers with a small a mini group of farm, farm hands from my company and my other farm friends that are out here. The, the food bank itself has underwritten this project. Uh, our Farm Bureau is, uh, is a partner with it. The University of California has helped with a discounted rent uh, we're working with our water district to hopefully bring some dollars that might help lower the cost of water. And what we are able to do is look at a project that potentially, again, because our highest costs are in, in our area are, are rent, water, and labor, and then all the other inputs that would be around, including fertilizers and the rest of the pest control that you have. But by the time we look at the numbers, we think we can deliver this product to the food bank for 15 cents a pound. Uh, and it may go as high as 20, 25% a pound someday, uh, depending on the crop. Uh, obviously, cabbage is a lot heavier than broccoli. Broccoli is a lot heavier than green beans. But uh, when you look at the cost for production and the uh, opportunities here, we're very excited because we, we've been doing this for so long. The proof of concept has existed. It's just a matter of replicating and scaling up. And, and, and overnight, we've done this. Uh, the food bank is so, uh, so engaged in it. They went out and bought all the bins and they are just having uh, a, a new way of looking at what it is they're trying to accomplish with the partners they have in, in, in your areas. And so I say this because when I look at a renaissance, we're talking about agriculture, big and small. We're talking about, it can be biodynamic, it can be organic, it can be conventional. I don't know why we fight about it. I don't know, I don't know why people think that the agriculture is broken when it's not. In fact, because of the pandemic, we were able to come through uh, the pandemic, I think, with, uh, oops, let me do this. We were able to come through that pandemic in our country and many of the developed countries, uh, basically with uh, more pride of accomplishment uh, in understanding that you can have a global disruption at that magnitude and still get a bulk of the food to the bulk of the people. And my, while you might not have had all your choices, we got that. While you might not have been happy with the way uh, something was packed, we get that. But the idea that the global food system responded and, and was able to pivot and turn and make a lot of things happen. And that's the, from the delivery trucking side to the, you know, up, up, down to the farm itself, the whole food chain, uh, it, it was pretty, pretty exciting. In those countries, in those underdeveloped countries that have been suffering all along with a lack of infrastructure, a lack of technology, a lack of knowledge, a lack of willpower, if you will, to change and allow for change. Uh, I think that's coming to an end very quickly. We see it happening as, as we speak. Here's a good example. I, I had a chance to go in 1994. Uh, I, I belong to a group called Western Growers. It's the fresh produce industry folks from the West Coast. We went to China in 1994 on a trade trip. Um, and the trade trip got us right into Beijing, right into uh, Guangzhou. And we took one look uh, and we realized that, wow, uh, in the produce industry, we, need, uh, we have highly perishable products that need refrigeration. We need transportation. We need distribution. And we, what we saw in 1994, that they didn't have any of that. There was no uh, really food chain. Uh, there were really no large food chains, uh, chain stores, if you will. And we turned around and said, well, let's just go back to Australia and Japan, because that's where our best op opportunities for export. We were very interested in exporting products uh, out to those areas. Yeah, I send strawberries from, you know, from Dubai to uh, um, Hong Kong for years um, in, in airplane deliveries. Um, but 
what we saw in 1994 and what you have seen today in China, and you see the rapid uh, transformation of a nation with a billion, population of a billion. If that's not a renaissance in, in full progress, I don't know what it is. Um, I don't know how we can not understand then that this idea, going back to those sustainable development goals, that this idea that there's an opportunity for uh, a different kind of world, I, I'm not talking about a world order, don't, don't, do, don't get me wrong here. Uh, whatever the system you have politically, economically, um, any of these systems have the capacity to deliver uh, a, a change of thinking, if you will, to what we're trying to accomplish to be uh, civilized on a, on a world. And, and again, the best thing we could be is competitive to see who can get there first. The best thing we can do is demonstrate that if the government doesn't get you there, well, then you just go out and do it yourself. Uh, where many of us are tired of this concept of a think tank. You know, how, how many more people that are non-productive uh, are you gonna pay to think about the problems that we have in a world uh, when what we need to do is be a do tank. And the do tank then is just, you go get it done. You just go make it happen. And, and so this, this picture is a good example to finish on. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say, this was a former military um, barracks, uh, officers barracks and, and uh, uh, housing area of the uh, former military base where we were farming on. And they pulled the houses off, they pulled the concrete off. And guess what was there underneath all the, uh, all, all the concrete? actually really good dirt um and 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 this this was our project uh, several years ago where everything uh, the three four five acres i mentioned that we would grow annually would go to a food bank but now that we're up to 40 acres now that we're approaching the idea that we're going to have an acre every week for 52 weeks that's 52 acres and then now we're thinking well why wouldn't it be 500 acres um these are the kinds of things and why wouldn't we end uh, nutrition deficiencies in our region because we can um, and there's a tremendous amount of charitable donations, a tremendous amount of in, interest uh, it, when it drags in the health community because of, these are healthier uh, kids. If it dwell, dra drags in the education department because a kid that's better nourished is a better student, you start to realize there's tremendous resources that we can pull in to do uh, and address just some of these things. So let me finish by saying, when, I, when we speak of a, an agricultural renaissance, it, 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 there are so many categories uh, where this is occurring, where this is in place, and where people are moving forward with or without government telling them whether they can or can't go, uh, or when they will go. Um, the, the universities have got to get into the 21st century. The land grant system needs to be all on board because you're sitting on all kinds of resources as well that can be pulled into play to create these solutions from the land. And I uh, will end it with that and take any questions you might have. E.G., I want to thank you. I wish I could demonstrate the applause in the background. Um, it's a standing ovation right now. Oh. Um, standing ovation just for your patience in this, in this process. Um, I have a, a list of questions I wish that I had time to, to ask, but I'm going to ask you two questions. So... The first question is, we have been talking about what agriculturalists can do. And we're interested in where you see the consumer in this equation and being part of the innovation. So we're interested in the reaction that you are getting in your area, not only from the, from the folks that you're feeding and feeding well, in, in the landowners that you are, you are returning this land to a, such an excellent purpose. But what, where do you see consumers in, in this equation? Well, again, thank you again for the opportunity to share with you today. Uh, and what we see is um, because of this tremendous, uh, a tremendous push for a, a healthier diet, uh, we see it everywhere. You see it on TV, of course, and you see it in the choices that are available to us. One of the projects we have in our region, which has been really exciting, and it was started by the city of Irvine, is the, a place called the Farm and Food Lab. Farm and Food Lab, unlike that project of producing food for the food bank, the Farm and Food Lab is, is kind of a, a 21st century show and tell 
very small, it's a two acre facility, but it's where the average citizen can come and uh, understand how they might transform their own backyard and their own front yard or their, inside their house even to edible landscape opportunities to bring in products that will help them with their, uh, with their basically daily dietary needs, whether it's salads, whether it's uh, other kinds of things. Uh, fruit trees are, uh, can be a spalier. And so there's great opportunity there for that tie in with the community. Those volunteers that are coming out to harvest, plant, and, and tend to the crops out there in the, in the, in the video I just showed. Um, these are companies that have charitable giving that they need to do. It might be high school students that need to graduate and do some charitable work. It might be uh, those, those companies that send their volunteers to clean up trash along the side of the road. All these wonderful companies are out there trying to plug in and be community uh, partners, if you will, in, in making things better. And the minute you make that opportunity open to them, it's 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 amazing how quickly they they actually love the fact that they get to be back in touch with the earth, back in touch with something. Most of them have never seen. Um, I mean, really, they get shocked to see broccoli in a field growing. They they can't believe that cabbage grows or celery grows the way it grows, and, and just that all by itself allows for a, a brand new uh, uh, outreach into the community to help them understand that agriculture is not simple, it's very complicated. And then the technologies needed uh, and involved also opens the door. This idea that agriculture can be a career of first choice is also where we're very excited that in this new narrative of, of where agriculture needs to be in this century is, is this whole desire to make agriculture a career of first choice across the spectrum of that food chain. And, and that's exciting because you get to talk about it. They get to see it by coming out to these projects. So, so there's a lot of good things happening there. So second and last question. And again, I wish we had a chance to go through my stack here. Um, but this is kind of a, a, a wrap up question. We are a membership of seven, 800 people that are the full gamut of the, the food and, and agricultural supply system. So we have producers in the room, we have consultants in the room, we have regulators in the room, decision makers, um, opinion leaders. But how do we as a group, uh, best challenge or support our membership to imagine these new technologies and possibilities. What, how, what can we do as a group to see this type of, of attitude first and foremost for innovation? Well, there's just several things. I know our wonderful group, Solutions from the Land, and Nathan Rudgers, you're out there somewhere in the audience. Uh, thank you for all your good work and your leadership. Um, sometimes it's it, it's a good example is just to convene in your region, in your state, uh, in your county, convene a bunch of the different stoke stakeholders and ask them if you were to look out to the year 2030, out the year 2040, what, what does your community, what is your agricultural systems look like. And the minute that you can kind of put that together, you, you check your, your credentials at the door and your, and your um, maybe even your agendas and your biases, but you, you start to talk about, uh, you uh, do a vision process and you pull that together. What is it that you want to accomplish? What does it look like? If you can all agree at what it looks like, then it allows everybody from wherever they are around the spectrum to move towards that on their own with their own capacity to get towards that vision. And then that opens the door. Uh, and we always say this, uh, seeing is believing. The proof of concept is if you can uh, go visit uh, and find a way to come and visit, whether it's these projects here, there's projects all over the country. I think I mentioned earlier, proof of concepts that have been up and running for years and doing really wonderful work, but they don't necessarily get that much publicity or attention. But the minute you start to see it, you go, oh, I get it. I can see what we can do with this property or that property or this group can come together and, and sustain a, a project that really has some great impact. So I would say that that visioning process first of what, what, what do you want, what, what, what do you want your region to look like? and agree upon that. And then now you have a work plan and you may, have, you may have already done that, but I know our group Solutions from the Land has been doing that kind of work in Florida and Ohio and I, Indiana and Iowa right now and actually looking toward the headwaters of the Colorado River right now towards some great projects where if you can create that alignment, then you have innovative collaboration possibilities that uh, we like to say it's one plus one equals three. 
you really start to see that there's much more dyn dyn dynamism and dynamic opportunity uh, once you see that it's not working out of a silo, it's working along a spectrum of opportunity. Well, with that, uh, AG, I, I want to thank you on behalf of the Ag Society. Thank you for your patience and your flexibility. And we look forward to hosting you when you can come to New York in full style. So okay. have a great flight okay. back to uh, Southern California. And thanks again for spending time with us. I, I still think I'm coming out to see you this afternoon if it works, believe it or not. You think you can? <laughs> I, 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 I've got a flight. We'll see if I get there. <laughs> okay. Okay. We'll hope Thank to you. See you then. All right, Thank bye you, bye everybody. Bye. Take care. P pleasure. Before we launch into what's happening in New York State regarding climate change policy making and how agricultural systems will play a role, I'd like to introduce Hansi Kuhns, who will be presenting the Business of the Year Award. I invite representatives from R.L. Jeffries and Sons to the stage for our 2022 honorees. The award is sponsored by the Northeast Agribusiness and Feed Alliance and Gold Star Feed and Grain. I encourage them to stand for recognition. Now there'll be a video. The New York State Agricultural Society Business of the Year Award recognizes agribusinesses for the quality, leadership, and innovation they demonstrate that enhance the integrity of the agricultural industry. Thank you to our sponsors, the Northeast Agribusiness and Feed Alliance and Gold Star Feed and Grain. Although their holdings stretch over 10,000 acres spanning three western New York counties, R.L. Jeffries & Sons, Inc. is a family business through and through. Our 2022 Business of the Year honoree is currently operated by fourth generation brothers Jim and Tom Jeffries and their family located in Wyoming, New York. The farm is a past winner of the New York State Agricultural Environmental Award and raises a mix of 15 different crops, ranging from dairy forages, grain crops, and processing vegetables. They also provide custom tillage, planting, and manure spreading, and are one of only two custom pea harvesters in the state, with a crew and equipment that can harvest 4,000 acres of green peas annually. With its roots in the farm, Pod Squad LLC has grown into a mid-sized trucking company, handling forage, grain, fertilizer, manure, lime, food waste, and more. Additional enterprises include Kirsch Egg Lime LLC and Navalis Irrigation. The Jeffrey's newest adventure is a wedding barn venue, bringing back to life an old neighboring farmstead. The Jeffreys are quick to acknowledge their employee team for their success. Collectively, they employ 50 people year-round and 20 part-time. One-third of the staff have been with the family for over 10 years and serve in key management roles. Active in the community, the Jeffreys support numerous fundraisers for local organizations and for the past 12 years has sponsored an agricultural scholarship to a college-bound senior in the Pavilion Central School District. Congratulations to the R.L. Jeffries & Sons for being our 2022 Business of the Year honoree. Thank you for your industry and community leadership, continued innovation, and stewardship of land and people. John Noble of Noble Hearst Farms is a member of the Agricultural Forest and Forestry Advisory Panel of the New York Climate Action Council. This group is making recommendations that will impact our industry in the short and long term as New York State wrestles with the na nation leading carbon goals. John will be serving as our moderator in this next session, and he is joined by Byron Stenmuller of the New York State Department of Ag and Markets and Suzanne Hunt of Hunt Country Wines. Welcome. Thank you. Well, I want to say that this has been a, you know, participating with the state, with Brian and, and Suzanne in this process of thinking about climate, climate changes, how we impact the climate, how agriculture can play a role in 
in both uh, being an advocate for and also helping sequester some of the carbon that's being produced in other sectors has been really rewarding. But I must say, I had to learn a few new terms along the way. Uh, you know, I'm a dairy farmer, right? We don't, we don't deal with you know, these fancy terms and these fan fancy acronyms all the time. So I'd, I had to learn about CLCPA, which Brian is going to talk about. I had to learn what climate resistant farm, re, re, climate re, resilient. resilient. I had to know <laughs> that too. Regenerative ag, this was new, a new deal for me. Carbon sequestration, I had some kind of an idea what we were talking about. GHG, one, one can get an idea what GHG would be. And enteric met methane. Now, you know, I'm a dairy farmer. I always thought that maybe methane produced from cattle was coming from one end versus another end. But as I learned through this process, most of the enteric methane that we're dealing with in the atmosphere now, coming from cattle, is coming from the front end, <laughs> not the back end. So these were all new, new things for me to learn. But anyway, we, we, we got together and we were thrown the challenge to the CLCPA to start thinking about you know, how agriculture can play a role in both reducing our methane emissions and sequestering uh, methane in the long term using uh, proper land use techniques. Forestry was a big part of our, our conversation. But agriculture wasn't the only, the only industry that was thinking about these issues. Uh, the building industry was thinking about this. How can they reduce their, their emissions? Electricity, transportation certainly was a huge one. But in general, agriculture itself is 6% of all the emissions going into the atmosphere. And, the, and we were given the challenge to think about how we reduce those emissions, both in, in 2030 and in 2050. So with that, I'm going to let Brian, which you've seen his bio, he's in, uh, involved with New York State Ag and Markets and also with Soil and Water Conservation Districts, and Suzanne Hunt, who is who's a vineyard operator, but she's also a uh, uh, principal in Generate Capital, which invests in green energy uh, projects across the country. So I'm going to let Brian go through his, his slides. Suzanne's going to talk about uh, her projects. And then we're going to open up the floor to questions. So with that, Brian. OK, thank you so much, John. Really appreciate that introduction. Uh, certainly has been a learning process for all of us over the past uh, uh, year, year and a half. So thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to start out today. I'm just going to give you a little bit of an outline for my uh, brief discussion here, give you an overview of the CLCPA, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, also known as the New York State Climate Act. But before that, I'm going to begin with a background on where we are now and show that we have a considerable head start in helping farms help the state meet its Climate uh, Leadership and Community Protection Act goals. Um, I'll then provide a brief overview of the Climate Act, provide a brief summary of the process to develop the recommendations that John just spoke about uh, through the Climate Action Council's Agriculture and Forestry Advisory Panel, and then provide a brief summary of the current recommended strategies developed by that panel. And finally, I'll pro provide a brief overview of the draft scoping plan and provide information about how to access this document and how you all can provide comments and input into the plan, into the process. Okay, I, I'm hoping that a lot of you are familiar with this acronym, AEM. Um, certainly, like I, I mentioned before, we have a considerable head start in meeting our environmental objectives and goals, and certainly our Climate Act goals here in New York State. So I just want to cover very briefly what some of the programs and technical support resources that are currently assisting farms to reduce emissions and implement practices that address these goals. The foundation of it all is the AIM program. The AIM program has provided a consistent conservation program delivery framework for over 20 years. This supports farmers in their efforts to protect water quality, conserve natural resources, address climate change, all while enhancing farm viability. AIM is open to all farms, all commodities, and all sizes. It works within the resources of each farm. It's voluntary, incentive, and science-based. 
watershed focused and locally led and delivered by county soil and water conservation districts and partners. It focuses on advancing farmers through the AIM planning, implementation, and evaluation tiers. This framework relies on strong technical support and relationship building between local conservation partners and farmers and does so in a way where farm business objectives are kept in mind in order to enhance agriculture's long-term economic viability. The AIM framework is adaptive to new and future opportunities and priorities such as climate change mitigation and adaptation. So in addition to the long-standing and popular agricultural non-point source abatement and control program, which is also under the AEM framework, the Climate Resilient Farming Grant Program was developed in 2015. The goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and sequester multi-sector emissions through soil health and also through vegetative practices such as repairing forest buffers, and also to help farms be more adaptive to our changing climate which builds resiliency not only on farmlands, but also in surrounding communities. Since 2015, $12 million has been awarded to 27 conservation districts across the state assisting 200 farms. An estimated 320,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent emission reductions per year. And currently the program offers three tracks of funding. Methane management through manure storage cover and flare systems, which are designed to mitigate the methane that is created from those manure storages and also provide resiliency by avoiding rainwater into those storages for farmers. Water management, which helps farmers prepare for two uh, currently experienced and, and certainly anticipated into the future uh, floods and, and both droughts. And also, also the Climate Resilient Farming Program funds what's called the Healthy Soils New York Program, which provides cost share assistance to farmers to implement soil health practices across their farm. Round six is estimated release in later uh, January this month, uh, where we'll be making $8 million available. Okay, so I know a lot of you are, are here to, to, to learn about uh, the Climate Act, and um, certainly there is so much to learn. It's a very, very wide uh, sweeping uh, law in New York State that was passed in July of 2019, so I'm really just going to scratch the surface uh, very briefly here what the, what the law uh, requires. Uh, the law requires a carbon neutral economy mandating at least an 85% reduction in emissions by 19, uh, below 1990 levels by 2050. In order to do that, uh, there are a number of benchmarks and uh, emission reductions that need to be uh, made or met um, along the way towards that, towards that 2050 goal. Uh, chief among them, 40% reduction in emissions by 2030. As it was stated earlier, that's just eight years away. 100% um, zero carbon electricity by 2040. 70% renewable electricity by 2030. 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035. 6,000 megawatts of distributed solar by 2025. 3,000 megawatts of energy storage by 2030 and 185 trillion BTUs of on-site energy savings by 2025. The law also set up a number of advisory panels. The Agriculture and Forestry Advisory Panel, as we talked about, the Land Use and Local Government Advisory Panel, the Transportation Advisory Panel, Energy Efficiency and Housing, Energy Intensive and Trade Exposed Industries, Power Generation, and Waste Management. The law also set up two working groups the Just Transitions Working Group and the Climate Justice Working Group, as the law has specific targets and commitments to climate justice in a just transition. What's really important to note here as well is that the 15% remaining emissions by 2050 in order to meet the carbon neutrality goal will have to be offset by an equal amount of carbon sequestration. Um, and that is uh, uh, natural carbon sequestration, services provided by our forests and by our farmlands. So it's not just about reducing our agricultural emissions, but also boosting and increasing our capacity for soil carbon and uh, forest carbon sequestration. Also important to point out here is that the CLCPA, or Climate Act, directs New York State to account for greenhouse gas emissions differently than other jurisdictions when considering our baseline and setting emission limits. It requires that certain emissions such as methane and nitrous oxide be evaluated with what's called a 20-year global warming potential rather than a standard 100-year global warming potential. 
And why is this significant? For nitrous oxide and for methane, the potencies change. Um, nitrous oxide and methane both being agricultural emissions. So for nitrous oxide, the potency actually, actually goes down but stays roughly the same at 300 times that of carbon dioxide in a 20-year uh, time frame in the atmosphere. But for methane, the potency of greenhouse gas when compared to carbon dioxide raises by an approximate factor of three, from 34 to 84 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So both nitrous oxide and methane are primary greenhouse gas emissions from farming, as I mentioned, nitrous oxide through cropping practices, mainly through the use of nitrogen fertilizers, and methane is emitted from livestock through what is known as enteric fermentation that John mentioned before, essentially the belching of methane from our ruminant uh, livestock farms, and also from manure management. So as I stated, the, the Climate Act requires that greenhouse gas emissions be accounted using this 20-year global warming potential for methane. So this does account for a large increase in the calculated impact of methane in the atmosphere from sources such as agriculture, waste, and the gas sectors. So as a result, this directs the New York, New York State to prioritize methane reductions while also working to advance all the goals stated here on this slide. Okay, so uh, the Agriculture and Forestry Advisory Panel was created uh, at, along with the other advisory panels that I just mentioned to assist the Climate Action Council in developing the scoping plan for how we're gonna reach these ambitious targets. The Agriculture and Forestry Advisory Panel is chaired by Richard, Commissioner Richard Ball, and the panel is made up of 18 experts in the field of agriculture and forestry. There's a diverse set of expertise that includes farmers, foresters, academic researchers, professors, policy experts, and conservation professionals. So the following ag and forestry recommendations that I'll talk about briefly were developed by this panel with DEC and ag and market staff support in order to get to the point of, of uh, developing these recommendations, the panel broke out into subgroups um, where we could go into depth on the diverse set of recommendations that I'm going to briefly cover. Livestock was a subgroup. Um, forest and forest management was a subgroup. Uh, Agroforestry and uh, uh, soil health. All of uh, the experts that you see here on this screen broke up into these subgroups in order to get into the weeds, get into depth on the strategies. So these subgroup meetings were held throughout this course of nine months and then were reported out to the full Ag and Forestry Advisory Panel meetings. We met about a dozen times over that same period of nine months. So although, although the full set of recommendations are very detailed, a couple of key themes became apparent across the panel recommendations. Reducing emissions from agricultural operations, specifically nitrous oxide from fields, and methane from livestock. Carbon sequestration and forests and farms, also a very key theme to, to our panel's recommendations. So this slide here covers the agricultural emission reduction recommendations. Again, this is very high level and a lot of detail went into all of this and certainly is contained within the uh, set of recommendations. Um, first, nutrient management. Reducing nitrous oxide emissions. Again, as I mentioned, 300 times the potency of, of, of carbon dioxide through more efficient use of nitrogen fertilizers while meeting yield and quality through expanded nutrient management planning and implementation on all agricultural fields and lands receiving fertilizers and nutrients. Um, certainly the AEM program uh, has advanced nutrient management planning and implementation across farms across the state for, for multiple decades. So we have a really considerable head start here where nitrous oxide emissions in cropland worldwide is the highest agricultural emission that's not the case in New York State where it makes up just about 8% of our agricultural emissions. So we have a great head start, but there's still more that can be done. Next, alternative manure management. Uh, sometimes the way manure is management on managed on livestock farms, it can have the potential to be a source of methane emissions. Um, as farms transition from daily spread to storage of manure, uh, the storage of that manure sometimes can create those methane emissions. So the panel talked about reducing emissions by implementing practice systems that are specifically planned and designed for each farm. As the panel recognized that farms are diverse and a one, -time, uh, one type of system does not fit all. So practice systems such as cover and flares, anaerobic digesters, carefully managed compost systems, and others that capture, destroy, or prevent methane uh, in the first place all fit within this recommended strategy. And next, reduce methane and secondarily nitrous oxide through precision feed, forage, and herd management. 
Many farmers are already doing this, but more can be done to fully achieve the emission reduction goals. This strategy requires a comprehensive outreach and training uh, program for all livestock farmers to utilize feed management tools. Further, the panel acknowledges that additional methane emission reduction may be realized from feed additives that are under development and if in, 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 in deemed safe for widespread and long-term use. So that's a key to uh, really uh, dramatically reducing enteric fermentation on livestock farms across the state. Okay, carbon sequestration in forests and on farms. The second main theme of the panel's recommendations include increasing carbon sequestration and storage. As I mentioned earlier, this increasing sequestration of emissions in soils and vegetation is the central strategy to meeting carbon neutrality by 2050. So to meet this goal, the panel identified several individual strategies, uh, starting with avoiding the conversion of forests and farmland, protecting our forests and protecting our farmland in New York State. Second, soil health, reducing net greenhouse gas emissions and increasing sequestration, storage, and environmental benefits through adoption of soil health management practices. For example, cover crops, double crops, reduced tillage, and perennial cropping systems, such as well-managed uh, grazing systems, also referred to as regenerative agricultural practices. We know that soil health practices uh, can cause a, a, create a multitude of environmental benefits, um, but the word adoption here is underlined for carbon mitigation um, soil health practices must be sustained in long term. Next, agroforestry, which is deliberately adding trees into areas of ag production, which can reliably increase carbon sequestration and other environmental benefits. Uh, these are practices such as silvopasturing, alley cropping, uh, repairing forest buffers. Although the panel has broader reforestation and afforestation goals, the panel also felt that integrating trees into active agricultural areas or at the edge of fields take, takes on a different approach and consideration. So like soil health, agroforestry practices have many other co-benefits, which include income diversification, increased farm viability, air and water quality, chief among, other, and chief among them. Forest management, increasing the carbon sequestration through improved and sustainable forest management practices. This will help to secure forest regeneration and improve the health and productivity and restore degraded forests so that they have the opportunity to sequester more carbon than if left in their current conditions. Reforestation and afforestation. Uh, simply put, this is planting trees, uh, focusing on underutilized agricultural lands, and also increasing tree density for understocked forests. And the climate-focused bioeconomy, yet another term that we learned throughout this process. Uh, really refers to advancing the portion of the economy that produces sustainable, renewable bio-based feedstocks rather than fossil fuel-derived feedstocks that produce products that achieve both the climate and also the social goals of the, of the CLCPA. So many of these recommended strategies strive to increase research, planning, and technical services as well as financial assistance to the farming and forestry sectors. This will improve access to programs and effective practices for all farmers and forest landowners but these strategies will also prioritize disadvantaged communities by placing emphasis on access to agriculture and forestry technical assistance and funding programs to historically underserved and disadvantaged community members. This helps to meet the climate justice commitments of the Climate Act as well. Okay, so this leads me to the draft scoping plan. Very comprehensive, very thick document. Uh, the scoping plan itself is well over 300 pages and with all the appendices, well over 800 pages, if you can believe that. Um, so the, the draft scoping plan <laughs> takes into consideration all of the other sectors and panels recommendations, such as transportation. And, and, and please, um, these bullets here are just very, very high level. A lot of detail is uh, contained in all of these. But for transportation, zero emission fleets, which includes off-road equipment and farm equipment, uh, will be accomplished uh, by 2050, with benchmarks by 2030. This should happen or will happen through a mix of battery electric, hydrogen fuel cell, and other low-carbon uh, uh, fuel um, uh, te technologies. Waste also includes recommendations for the reduction of methane through avoiding organics and landfills, and also uh, uh, recommends the strategic use of, of current biogas from those landfills. Land use and local government includes the Agriculture and Forestry Advisory Panel recommendations for avoided conversions, forest and farmland protection, afforestation and reforestation. 
The land use local government also talked about wetland protections and maintaining those wetlands for environmental benefits, including carbon sinks. Uh, gas systems transition, uh, downsizing and perhaps eventual dismantling of the state's fossil gas system, talked about in that chapter. Buildings, there's the transition mainly in home heating to highly efficient electric heat pumps for primary heating, cooling, and hot water. And of course, the scoping plan also contains um, chapters on climate justice, just transition, public health, and uh, elements to measure our success. The draft scoping plan was really recently approved by the Climate Action Council at their December 20th meeting to go out for public comment. Um, this plan is actually available on the Climate Action Council's website, which is climate.ny.gov. Uh, there will be an open comment period for this uh, for a minimum of 120 days. It started on January 1st and will run through April 22nd, or I'm sorry, April 2022. Um, the comments will be posted publicly after the comment period closes. In addition uh, to uh, being able to access this plan on that website, the Climate Action Council uh, members and, um, and state agency staff will be supporting public hearings and public outreach events um, uh, to um, just help the, the public understand what is in this plan. Um, so uh, that's a very, very broad overview of the Climate Leadership Community Protection Act. And certainly, um, hopefully, I gave you an idea that uh, here in New York State, we are doing great things through our AEM framework, our Climate Resilient Farming Program, our other uh, conservation programs. In addition, of course, we have USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service doing great work. All of this is helping farmers and our forest owners um, get that head start that we need in order to implement this plan. Um, at that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Suzanne, who is going to be talking more about how we get there, de-risking um, uh, these approaches, and talk about our own experiences on our own farm. So thank you so much. Okay. The, can I have the clicker? Go. Oh, okay. Here you go. Good morning, everybody. So unlike these guys, I guess, I've been studying these climate terms since I was a little kid on our small family farm. Um, so I, I have to say this, um, Brian made that all sound very smooth, but I have to tell you there were very diverse <laughs> sets of experiences and opinions in just our ag and forestry panel. And um, I guess I'm supposed to take this off for for this. Um, and I really, it was extraordinary how, how everybody came together and really built real consensus around the set of recommendations. And it was, you know, 12 meetings with everyone, but there were sub panels and sub panels. And so it was a real labor of love for everyone involved and everyone learned a lot. So I think there's a lot of value even in the process. Um, but I'm, I was asked to, to talk a bit about what we're doing on my family's farm. So I'm going to just run through some of the high points and I'll be here for the rest of the day if anyone wants to talk to me about any particular topics. Um, so, you know, as we've been discussing today, all of agriculture is being impacted by climate change and will increasingly be impacted by climate change. But fine wine grapes are one of the most sensitive crops to climate change. So the wine industry has been looking at this issue and literally we've, we can taste the changes in the wine. And I mean, I remember being little, little, little and, and pulling viticulture and enology magazines off the coffee table where they're talking about the, the ch changing, the, the coming changes. So this has been um, something that the wine industry has had a very clear-eyed vision of for decades now. Um, so we're doing our part and we're trying to mobilize the whole wine industry to do their part to uh, mitigate climate change. We've essentially eliminated all of our fossil fuel use, use for heating, cooling, and power. Um, before I get into the renewable energy systems, the cheapest energy is usually energy avoided versus generating new energy. So you always want to start with efficiency. There's lots of programs out there. Um, I think our utility did an audit for us on our lighting years ago and wanted us to spend $20,000 to change every single light in every closet and storage area. And we said, thank you very much. And we spent $2,000 and we just changed the, the most important 300 lights, I think it was. Um, and if you haven't gone and looked in, lately at these different efficiency and renewables options, take another look because the prices are going down radically really fast. I think it was about 10 years ago we looked at changing these big monster inefficient lights on the left there 
and then it, it was going to be $1,000 per fixture to put these new LEDs in. And then we looked again five years ago, and it was $80 a fixture, and we get a lot better lighting. So uh, it's changing really quickly. Um, Ten years ago, we put in this geothermal heating and cooling system. Um, you know, as a customer service business in our tasting room, these are silent. And then they also, once the drilling is done and the holes in the ground, um, they don't take up any land and there's no visual impact on your farm. Um, this is a closed loop um, ground source heating and cooling system, so there's no interaction with the water table. We decided to put our solar on the roofs. Um, you can certainly put it on the ground, uh, but these panels last for decades, and I don't know what I want to do with a given piece of ground in five or 10 years, let alone 20 or 30. So we chose to put them on our roofs just to give ourselves the most optionality with the ground. Um, we happen to have a lot of roofs, so <laughs> we were able to put up 109 kilowatts. Um, the next thing we did three years ago, we put in five level two EV chargers so that our customers could come and charge up for free while they're sipping wine. Um, and, uh, you know, it seems kind just, of high tech. One minute, how long does it take to? to Don't drink and drive. I think I'm required <laughs> to say that. Um, well, so, so charging your electric vehicle is a lot, like, a lot like charging your cell phone. You're almost always going to charge it at home overnight. And the nice thing about having destination chargers like this is that if you're stressed out about you know, being able to make it to all of your places, you're worried in the cold winter that you know, if you have your heating turned up and all your gadgets plugged in, you know, maybe you won't, you, you know, you're going to be stressed out at the end of your drive. Now you can top off. So you get, depending on how many cars are char charging at one time, you get 20 or 30 miles per hour that you're charging on a level two. Um, I thought I would do a flashback, actually. So we are a seventh generation family farm. My nieces and nephews are eighth generation. The handsome guy in the middle there somewhere is my great great grandpa. These guys pooled their money in 1897 and built the region's first power plant. And then they built a little railway from Penyon to Cuca Park to Branchport. And they had their own power generation and their own electric railway 125 years ago. So we put in some chargers, and we're literally just catching up to the, the generation 125 years ago that was producing their own power and, and empowering their own transportation. So one of the things that I think is really extraordinary is a lot of this stuff seems high tech, and we're literally just starting to take the boot of the oil industry off of our neck after 100 years. So um, it's really not that new. <laughs> Actually, we're going back to where we were in many ways. Um, so on the farm vehicle side of things, um, there are not, I'm sure you all know, a whole lot of options out there yet. You can start to sign up for some electric tractors now. Um, we picked up this electric gator a few years ago, spent 1200 bucks, and we got it used, spent 1200 bucks to put new batteries in it. It runs all day, we all fight over it, it's the best, it just starts and goes, you don't have to fight with the choke and the gears and um, starts and stops instantly, so it's just way, uh, it's just functionally way better for us. Um, my old Chevy Volt is 10 years old now, it's a plug-in hybrid, so even in the vehicle market, this isn't, this isn't especially new. Um, I know most of us want to talk about soil carbon and the, the ag side of things, but on the production side, since many of us end up getting into value-added products at some point, um, we you know, have done some interesting things, I think, in waste reduction. A few years back, it dawned on me that the little capsule on the top of the bottle is literally just a single-use plastic. I thought it had some function. Turns out you really don't need it. Um, so we, uh, we just stopped using the, the little plastic capsule and braced ourselves for customer complaints because any time you change anything, someone's not going to be happy. Um, and it's literally the only thing I think we've ever changed in 40 years of business in the wine industry where we haven't gotten complaints. It turns out people don't like it. It slows down their glass of wine. <laughs> so, um, so sometimes you can make changes that are better for the environment, and then they're, they're better for us. They save us money, and it's actually better for the customer. And I think it looks better. I think it looks sleeker. Um, building materials. I threw in this slide. Um, when we were shut down for three months at the beginning of the pandemic, we tried to turn some, some lemons into lemonade. We took the opportunity to put in new flooring. When you get tens of thousands of feet going over your floor every year, it, they wear out pretty quickly. And if you've ever ripped out flooring, you know it's a ton of work. It's a mess. And then you have to landfill all of that material. So we worked with a, an, a company that I've admired for decades called Interface. 
um, where they have been innovating all kinds of new materials. They offset all of the carbon generated in the production of the materials. This is a flooring because it's such a big space and it flexes, you need a flexible flooring. So this is actually a fully recycled vinyl flooring product that's flexible and soft, uh, especially if you have to stand on it all day. And then um, in 20 years when it wears out, we can pull it up and it goes right back into the material cycle. So one of the new terms that John has probably been using a lot more <laughs> this year than the rest of his life is the circular economy. So instead of this linear economy where we extract materials and then we landfill them, we actually keep things going just like a natural ecosystem. Everything is an ingredient for another process. Um, this is probably everyone's favorite topic today, um, talking about soil health as an adaptation and mitigation strategy. Um, on the left, we're mixing compost that we make with some biochar that we traded for some wine for. <laughs> Um, and some chicken manure. Um, for, with permanent crops like vine crops and tree crops, it's a lot harder to get that good stuff down into the root zone. Um, so anytime we're planting replacement vines or new vines, we'll put a whole bunch of it down in the hole. Um, we are working actually with the, the climate uh, resilient farming program. We're gonna start a two-year study where modeled basically after the work, if you've, if you've ever looked at what they've done in the Marin Carbon Project, um, they found out west that if you add um, an intensive amount of carbon just on the surface of degraded pasture land, you get a one-time long-term soil carbon, soil health benefit. So we're gonna experiment and see, and I wouldn't call our, land, our, our soils on our farm degraded, but it, they have been continuously farmed for 200 years. So they're well used, <laughs> and you know, we have been putting a concerted effort into you know, building up the organic content um, but we're gonna see like how far can we push that um, and what are the impacts on our crops. Um, so one of the other things we do um, to add organic matter is we use hay, hay as mulch. Um, this helps suppress the weeds for a little while. It also helps hold the moisture. Um, we had, we've had two pretty extreme drought periods since I moved home six years ago, six and a half years ago. Um, and you could literally see the rows where we ran out of hay bales because the grass was in 2016 when we had a severe drought. You could, the grass would dry up and die between the grapevine rows in the rows where we didn't have the mulch and it was still green in the other rows. So all that talk about how the, you know, the water holding content, you can really notice, start to notice it pretty quickly on your farm. My brother um, was making about 100 tons a year of compost for us with all the pumice coming out of the presses and um, all the yard waste from the neighbors and, and all the other organic waste from our farm and the local um, cafeteria at the local college. Um, he now has a, a composting business that he's running and he's sold out for the next two years solid. Um, so that's a growing business in the state. Um, and um, of course we all go steal it for the gardens too. We have certified a few sections of the farm organic. Um, with, with the permanent crops, we don't have as many tools in our toolkit as we do with annuals. Um, we can't rotate the fields, <laughs> we can't plant cover crops and plow them under. Um, but we are trying to figure out how to keep organic vines healthy in our challenging environment. Um, we're imploring the ag research world to come up with better tools for us. Um, and you know, there are trade-offs. You know, one of the things that we, we talk about a lot in all of these conversations is, is trade-offs. If you know, we reduce herbicides, but then we have to, which is better for health, happier employees, they don't have to handle that material. Um, but then do we have to do a lot more tractor passes? Is that more soil compaction? Is it more labor costs? So, um, so it's, there's a lot to, uh, to work on there. One of our adaptation to climate change strategies um, is uh, in our vinifera, the, the European vines, the Chardonnays, the Rieslings, the Cabernet Francs, those are, of course, the more high value, more desirable <laughs> wine grapes. Um, they're, of course, the most finicky and susceptible to cold and other stresses. So in 2014, when warm air masses um, moved into the Arctic and destabilized the polar vortex and moved some of that polar air down, um, we're at the highest elevation of the Finger Lakes on Cuca. We, we got down to about minus 18 degrees at our place and had absolute devastation in our vinifera. But our rugged, resilient hybrids, many of them coming out of Cornell, um, they were okay, and we had a harvest from those, but not from the vinifera that year. So one of the things we do now is we, tie, we drop a wire to the ground after harvest, and we tie a cane from every single vine to that wire. And then we used to, to roll round bales and rake them on. Now we, we just bought a, a round bale chopper, and we're spitting the hay right onto the vines. But you know, that's one of the impacts of climate change is, is more labor, more costs, more difficult. 
So one of the things I would urge folks to do is, you know, this can all be daunting and you already have plenty of work to do. <laughs> so um, get together with your peers, with some neighbors, and figure this stuff out together. Meet for breakfast once a month or something. This can actually be really interesting and, and, uh, and fun if you're figuring out these new ideas and strategies um, with your peers. Um, and also use your voice. You know, we, we're the people that feed everyone. You know, when we speak, politicians listen. And not necessarily when your industry reps speak, but when actual farmers call up their representatives, they really listen. So um, make that part of your, your kind of your, your schedule every month. Call your representatives, let them know what you need. Um, and you know, we were able to um, push our, <laughs> we were able to convince our uh, congressman uh, a while back to cross the aisle and help extend some tax credits that were gonna expire and while fossil fuels are still wildly, massively subsidized, it's not a level playing field, so we still do need supports for the clean stuff. Um, one of the themes that we've heard mentioned already today quite a bit is resilience. Um, this is one of the, the, the big co-benefits of many of the things that we are gonna be doing to reduce our impact on the climate are also gonna have the benefit of making our farms more resilient. Um, we actually just launched uh, a new line of wines uh, because climate change is taking us into uncharted territory in the wine world. It's literally changing um, how the grapes grow and the flavors and the expressions, the phenolics, the sugar levels, all of it. Um, and so the, the world over, it's fascinating um, studying the experience in the different regions and the different parts of the world. Um, but uh, we launched this new line of wine called Uncharted Terroir to um, really celebrate some of these rugged, regionally adapted, climate resilient grape varieties like Cayuga White and Balvin Muscat and Treminet. Um, and so, um, so, so basically, you know, instead of the world planting yet another acre of Cabernet Sauvignon, which is, represents 25% of all the vineyards in the entire world when there are thousands of grape varieties and hundreds that make delicious wine, um, we're gonna try and get people more curious and more supportive of a more diverse mix of grape varieties. And, and that goes for all of, of, of ag products. We need to celebrate the diversity. Um, and I've stuck this slide in there because, you know, it's not all, <laughs> it's not all rainbows and, and, and sunshine. Um, sometimes you try things and they don't work. You know, sometimes you're on the cutting edge of innovation and sometimes you're on the bleeding edge. Um, we were given this little vertical axis wind turbine about 12 years ago. I put it up to show that wind could come in all shapes and sizes. And the thing, you know, I think my dad spent three days digging trenches and he bought all this, you know, conduit and put it in. And it never worked very well. <laughs> um, so now it's um, a really ugly raptor perch. <laughs> I think it's best, best and highest purpose is, is for our raptors to sit there, um, uh, which is helpful. Uh, but, you know, I think one of the things that's been interesting through this last year is to see that this climate law passed, um, but it didn't have, and it, and it put all these huge requirements on the New York State agencies, but it didn't give them new staff and it didn't give them any funding. So people like Brian were given this huge mandate and no support to get it done. Um, and so it's completely understandable that what they did is they looked at the existing programs like AEM and others and said, how do we get this done through our existing frameworks with our existing teams? Um, I've been looking at it from the perspective of how do farmers get this done with their existing resources and their existing teams. And so the way I see this working is to, have, is to make it less risky and less costly for farmers. And I think we have to be a lot more innovative about how we do that. So we can talk more about that in the Q&A, but um, I think a lot of the conversations that have been happening in these panel discussions and these state agency discussions have had this just inherent orientation that the state's gonna pay for things, the government's gonna pay for things. And we all know that the government has a limited set of resources to work with. So if we want this to happen at big scale, if we want it to happen quickly, we have to think broader than that. And we have to think about public-private partnerships. We have to think about how we leverage public um, uh, private sector finance that's looking for climate smart investments. Um, it's that we have to come up with new tools, better insurance, all those things. So hopefully we'll have time to talk about that. Um, I don't wanna take time away from that interesting discussion, so I'll just skip. I wanted to point out that we, are, we have lots of plans for what we're gonna do next on our farm, um, including working uh, with some of the state programs that Brian's been talking about. And then I'll, maybe I'll just leave this slide because it's some of the more juicy topics for us to, to discuss. Great, thanks. Let's get these folks a hand.
<clears throat> Anne's got a burning question or two that she's trying to uh, get my attention. So we have these lovely ambassadors, handsome ambassadors, uh, to answer, to help you raise questions with our panelists. So just raise your hand and make sure that we, uh, we have you on the microphone so with the recording we'll be able to hear your question. So I'm going to set them loose. John, maybe you have a question. I think I have one. Oh, down there. So we have about five, five, seven minutes that we can take questions. Okay. Hi, I'm Carol Doolittle, Farm Winery Number 44 in New York State. Suzanne, I was delighted to see what you were talking about with the reducing capsules and reusing the recycled floor. You're all familiar with the extended producer responsibility again this year. It will affect everyone in this room and we will need to make some changes. Is Ag and Markets or AEM involved in the conversations with the uh, governor's office and the uh, legislators on this very important but little known topic? I can try to answer that question. Um, there's a lot of room for growth in the AEM uh, program framework and certainly the climate resilient farming program and framework beyond our traditional conservation measures. AEM and CRF are very much focused on uh, water quality and climate resiliency, helping farmers to adapt to a changing climate, primarily uh, through the more judicious and efficient use of water. But we also recognize through this process, um, as we've been talking about, that there is a host of additional um, uh, needs, opportunities for farmers outside of the realm of, of conservation programming. And those conversations um, you know, certainly didn't start with the uh, Climate Act and the panel, uh, and certainly uh, won't conclude with that either, um, that those you know, conversations are ongoing about how we can uh, work together uh, in maybe less traditional ways to uh, bring resources uh, out there to farmers and uh, making sure that if it's not our conservation districts, it's the partnership that's working out there with our farms uh, who uh, can, can take in these interests and these opportunities and help direct farmers um, to the uh, available resources and technical service providers. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. It's on my list to study. I think there's two versions uh, in my, uh, it's on my list to study and then figure out how we can get some consensus around because I know a lot of industries have been fighting it. So I have a copy of it if you'd like, if you'd like to take a look at it. And really, climate change is affected by reducing our consumption, our beginning consumption, then reusing what we have, and then recycling as you've done. So see me afterwards if you want any more information on EPR. Sure, that'd be great. Yeah, it's been interesting. We joined a group, a new group called International Wineries for Climate Action. And some of the big boys, you know, we make five or 10,000 cases of wine for us a year. And now with the huge explosion in wineries, we now make wine for 12 other wineries as well. And what the big boys who make, you know, six million cases a year have found when they audited their emissions is the glass bottles were actually one of the biggest sources of emissions in the whole wine footprint. And that's completely out of our control. So we're coming together as an industry to work with the glass industry to get there to improve their carbon footprint. We got a question over here. Hi, good morning. I'm Rick Zimmerman. And I have a couple comments to make about the CLCPA, and then I ask for the panel's uh, reaction to that. First and foremost, I want to thank you, John, Suzanne, and Brian, and Commissioner Ball, and the folks that would, are on the Forest and Agricultural Work Group for the hard work you put into this massive challenge. Um, you're be, you are to be commended for your time and your leadership in the effort. It is an important topic for all of you in this room. I highly encourage you to study the scoping plan. And Brian, if you could find that slide, I don't know if that's possible to go back to that one page where you bulleted the scoping plan. It's really important to take a look at it. There's so much behind it. And in some ways, folks, I think that the, st the deck is stacked against us to a certain degree in, in the agricultural industry. And that's why I want you to spend some time studying this, this issue. 
It's important that we step up to the plate on this as it pertains to the agriculture, agriculture industry's role in meeting the carbon reduction goals that have been established. It is a tremendously exciting time for agriculture to be part of this discussion, but if we're not part of this discussion, we're going to have a lot of challenges thrown at us that you're not going to like at all. Manure should be a cash crop that we should be able to profit from, from as a result of the CLCPA. Folks, right now, that does not look to be a bright spot, at least from my opinion, unless we engage and keep this thing going forward. Renewable natural gas, for example, or using manure as a source for green hydrogen, as an example, are two potentially fantastic opportunities that are not necessarily factored into the, per the plan right now. In fact, I watched the Climate Action Council in their last meeting basically step away from recognizing low-carbon bio-based fuels as part of the solution. They haven't completely stepped away yet, but in fact are being pushed in a different direction than what you think we ought to be going because of others that have a different agenda within the Climate Action Council. So it's important we step up to the plate and make this part of the agricultural industry for the future. But it will only be done so if there, in fact, are economic incentives for us to take advantage of. And Suzanne can talk all about the opportunity when it comes to anaerobic digestion and the role it can play within this big picture. There are lots of developers that are in the state or certainly knocking on the door that would love to take advantage of the opportunity should it be available to us here in New York. California is leading the way. And AG, who was on the screen uh, earlier this morning, helped set the stage a few years ago in that process. We should study them carefully. They are really doing a phenomenal job in recognizing bio-based, particularly uh, agriculture bio-based fuels within the whole notion of decarbonizing our world. So uh, that's my, my pitch to you. Uh, folks, I know you know all about this on, this on the stage. Maybe you can reflect on that as it pertains to your conversations in the Ag and Forestry uh, Committee. <clears throat> Rick, the glass is half full. <laughs> we have an opportunity here in the food and agricultural system to be a part of this solution. And I encourage all of us, as Suzanne has demonstrated and Brian's talked about, that we can affect change if we can only imagine. I think that was one of the hardest things for me trying to uh, participate in this conversation was what we know today is not what we're going to know 50 years from now. And we have to, be, we have to open ourselves up to those opportunities. We did not know, Rick, that we were going to have $900 a ton nitrogen costs when we started this process, right? Now, that changes the, the, the whole dynamics of how we're going to fertilize this crop going forward. And I don't think these things are gonna change, so we have to be open, we have to view this thing as an opportunity, not as, not as a challenge. Funding is gonna be a challenge, but uh, you know, as Suzanne's talked about and, and people that she's working with, there is private monies available to start to participate with the agricultural community to help uh, fix some of these challenges. I think our greatest fear was that the regulations get ahead of the opportunities. And so I, it, it may be that the Climate Action Council feels a little bit differently than what we would feel on the advisory council level, but um, I, I'm really hopeful and optimistic that that we're going to have an opportunity to be a part of this process, and uh, it's, it's going to work out fine for us. Yeah, but we have to engage. And you know, thanks for teeing that up, Rick. I think he, um, let me echo, I think he uh, uh, invoked my name on that because when, with my other hat, when I'm policy director for Generate Capital, one of the areas we provide financing for infrastructure in is the waste sector. So we finance anaerobic digesters uh, for food waste and for dairy waste, as well as electric buses and solar and other things. Um, and I, what I would say is that uh, it, you know the scoping plan was just released. There's three months of public comment. There are going to be six different public forums. Participate, 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 because. The other thing I would say is we need to invite folks out to see these assets. We need to do study tours, 
People need to understand what these things are. Um, and then some of the pushback to biogas and to digesters has come from um, places of concern about continuing to combust fuels, um, concern that anything um, that combusts is going to delay us from electrification. So I think you know engagement and engagement with empathy because people you know people aren't trying to hurt ag; they're they're trying to advance what they believe to be their best interest. So if we communicate you know with empathy and transparency, I think we'll get a, a do better than going into fight mode. I'll just add. Go ahead. Bro. I was just going to I was just going to add to that uh, very quickly as well. So the Climate Action Council um, voted to release the draft scoping plan for public comment. Um, doesn't mean that the draft scoping plan is complete or done. Um, they're going to be receiving comment for 120 days and continuing to work on this scoping plan for this whole year for the final release early in 2023. And then every five years after the scoping plan will be evaluated and adjusted. Um, so just as, as Suzanne and, and John mentioned, um, there's a lot of, of opportunity in it, but there's also a lot of um, um, opportunity to comment on it and, and on the process. So um, put this slide back up as well, Rick. I think this covers the, the, uh, the very uh, you know, easiest way to, to get your voice heard, but there will also be public forums and hearings on the draft scoping plan. Chris is going to kick us off the stage. Help me in <laughs> thanking these folks for participating. Thank you very much, John, Brian, and Suzanne, for sharing your expertise. Um, I wouldn't be in a rush, but you know we got lunch coming up. <laughs> now I'd like to welcome Sean Bossard, chair of our Century Farm Committee and our 2022 honorees to come forward, including Mark and Eric Delaney of Delaney Farms, Susan and Elizabeth Donnerwitz, and Bob Snyder and Michael Latham of Snyder Farms. These hardworking farm families are being honored by the New York State Ag Society on Farm Credit East for the 100 years of continuous operation. Will Farm Credit East staff please stand? And now we'll have a video. Since 1937, the New York State Agricultural Society has recognized farm families who have successfully operated their businesses for 100 years or more on the same property. These operations have been critically tested and serve as a treasured ideal for New York's 33,000 family farms. In 2022, we're pleased to honor three farms from the Hudson Valley, Southern Tier, and Central New York regions. During the dead of winter in 1916, father and son James and Bernard Delaney moved their dairy herd and family belongings across a frozen skinny atlas lake to a new farm west of Syracuse. Dairy farming was the farm's chief focus until 1974 when fire destroyed three barns. A decade later, greenhouses were erected by David and Joanne Delaney, the fourth generation, to produce vegetable and ornamental plants for retail. They also diversified into growing sweet corn and other vegetables to sell at their farm stand and local farmers markets. Today, Eric and Mark Delaney, the fifth generation, continue to grow more plants and vegetable varieties and have added delivery options to other retail operations and restaurants. Located in a largely residential area in Onondaga County, the Delaney's are doing their best to reduce their carbon footprint. They are non-GMO and utilize integrated pest management and good agricultural practices that are certified by the USDA. They have also written a food safety plan. Dunderwitz Farm, located in Steuben County in the foothills of the Appalachians, was established in 1920 by Polish immigrants Valentine and Mary Donderwitz. Acreage has grown threefold, up to 600 acres, under the management of the third and fourth generations, Susan and daughter Elizabeth. Angus and Hereford cattle are grass-fed and allowed to free range from birth to finish. The apple orchard has 300 trees under cultivation and multiple organic vegetables are produced, including garlic, asparagus, and maple syrup. Working through Cornell Cooperative Extension of Steuben County, the farm obtained a grant from New York State in 2016 that enabled them to launch the orchard, rebuild fence lines, 
and reestablish sustainable sources for cattle. Education, environmental stewardship, community engagement, and family are all core farm values. After serving in World War I, Walter Snyder came to the Basic Creek Valley at the base of Catskills Mountain to establish Snyder Farm in 1919. Much of the farm's perishable goods were sold door to door in nearby Albany. When World War II erupted, some families served in the Atlantic and the Pacific, while siblings, Bob and John, stayed home on the farm. At age 87, Bob is still the principal owner and operator. A premier dairy until the 1990s, Bob now raises beef, hay, and corn with the help of his nephew and family. The farm participates in AEM, which is a voluntary incentive-based program that helps farmers make sound environmental decisions to protect and conserve natural resources. Congratulations to our farms. Thank you for your ingenuity, steadfastness, and true grit. Thank you also to our award sponsor, Farm Credit East. Each farm will receive an official proclamation from Governor Kathy Hochul, an adorable sign promoting their award for their farmstead. Congratulations. I'd like to welcome Barb Hanselman, the chair of the Ag Promotion Committee and the 2022 honoree of the Ag Promotion Award, Joan Petson of Cornell Cooperative Extension of Wyoming County and Stephanie Castle of American Farmland Trust. The Ag Promotion Award is sponsored by the New York State FFA Foundation, Legacy Wealth Advisors, and Alpha Gamma Rho, or Alpha Zeta Fraternity. Will our sponsors please stand? The New York State Agricultural Society's Ag Promotion Award recognizes individuals and groups for their efforts to improve the public's understanding of agriculture. Thank you to our sponsors, Alpha Zeta Fraternity, the New York State FFA Foundation, and Legacy Wealth Advisors. Our 2022 honorees have combined their expertise and financial resources to improve the public's understanding of sustainable agricultural practices in the Genesee River Valley. Congratulations to the American Farmland Trust, Cornell Cooperative Extensions, Northwest New York Dairy, Livestock and Field Crops Teams, and the Great Lakes Protection Fund. Research identified information gaps and production barriers as inhibitors for producers adopting certain soil health practices. As a result, the project focused on grower education as a way to increase adoption of conservation practices. With documented success in hand, additional grant dollars were secured to fund a photo exhibit, an online photo essay of 10 farms, highlighting the farmers and landowners' passion for protecting land and water resources. The Our Farmers, Our Water, Our Future traveling display premiered at the Arts Council of Wyoming County early fall 2021. It was developed by documentarian and storytelling photographer Rebecca Drobes. The project has received national attention and has prompted important conversations with decision makers and opinion leaders about the essential role that farmers and agriculture have in soil conservation and water quality. The New York State Agricultural Society encourages you to view the online photo essay available at farmland.org forward slash Great Lakes. Congratulations to this important group and thank you for your important work to bring agriculturalists and neighbors together to protect our community's natural resources.
Well, this concludes our morning session. We will meet again in this room at 1230 for lunch. I encourage you to visit our exhibit space outside and reconnect with peers. Introduce yourself to the Ag Ambassadors. We'll see you at 1230.